so, um, RPG Maker games. They're really fucking weird. If you're somebody who clicked on the video just to comment on the video length, there you go. That's it. That's the video. If you want to, go ahead and take that line and comment why'd it take you hours just to say this when small word do trick. Anyways, as somebody who's always been a fan but has admittedly hardly ever delved into the RPG maker genre or community, I've always had a few thoughts about them from an outsider's perspective. Mostly, what the actual fuck is going on in any of these games? And I hate to say it, I was kind of intrigued. But I never really knew where to start. But eventually my answer came in the form of a deep revelation about myself as a person. I guess I'm a YouTuber now, which means I can buy way too many of them, and justify spending that much money and time on the fact I get to make a video about them and people might watch it. Woo. Now I'll be honest, I'm usually known as two things. I'm either quote, that war crimes guy, or that masochist. Both titles I wear very proudly, but this is going to be my first delve into this style of content. Mostly because I've actually always found it interesting and wanted to do it, but I wasn't comfortable enough with my channel style to actually go through with it. You know, stuff like editing, video structure, scripting, writing, especially recording. Have you listened to some of my older videos? I used to be really high-pitched and record all my lines in one breath and borderline suffocate myself because you shouldn't record audio like this. So now that I'm a bit more comfortable with how I make videos, let's go ahead and, um, play and look over some RPG Maker games. Now a few things before we dive in, and I want to get this clear immediately, despite my deadpan, dry, and generally unenthusiastic humor, I've always tried to steer clear of jokes that might be considered offensive or considered in poor taste, but these games cover some very dark and morbid topics that I could say with a relative amount of confidence isn't poggers. So this Star Wars scroll background thing that's going on right now is a pretty concise list of things that might not be considered very funny. If any of this upsets you, feel free to skip around or just opt into not watching the video. I promise you won't hurt my feelings. Speaking of which, secondly, you might look at the thumbnail and go, ha ha, it's called a brief glance and it's fucking massive. But unlike the Pokemon video, this is kind of a genuine title. Some of these games have insane amounts of depth. Lisa, for example, has enough in it that there are channels dedicated entirely to Lisa. And if this makes sense, this video is kind of like a bunch of smaller scale videos packed into one. Because as ironic as it sounds, making this video really long means I don't feel guilty skipping over things that don't interest me and I don't have to go extremely in-depth with every little topic or piece of dialogue. You aren't going to skip the one shot and be like, oh no, I missed the tangent at 43 minutes and 14 seconds talking about how an NYPD season 11 was actually an artistic masterpiece and why Off is a terrible game. And another thing that this does is incentivize you to use the chapters feature. Have a game you want to skip because no no? Good. Do you not want to watch this video all at once? I would highly recommend that. Not interested in the game? I guess I'm not either, even though I am because I'm the one making the video. You get the point. Also, obviously there will be spoilers for every single one of these games, so take that word of caution and, you know, utilize it. If you're curious on the full list of games, as of scripting, it is currently off, Lisa the Painful, Joyful, Hylix, One Shot, Grimm's Hollow, and To the Moon. Also, I don't really do call to actions often, but this isn't a full list of games I wanted to play. For example, I really wanted to play through a Mori and maybe Yuma Nikki in this video, but I didn't because there was just so much time ate away in scripting, recording, audio editing, etc. So if you watch through this video and you like it, I guess feel free to press buttons, but more importantly, if you have any games or different genres you'd like to see the style in or have any criticisms, feel free to let me know. I read every comment I get, despite the fact that quite a lot of them are really stupid because it's a YouTube comment section, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, hell, while scripting this out, I thought about doing a video exactly like this, but with a tower defense genre. So if you're interested, have something else in mind, or generally have an issue with this style, because again, I'm new at making this, feel free to let me know. Anyways, on to the first game that we're going to cover in depth. Off. 
Off is a game made in the forbidden language that I personally loved since it was my first ever RPG Maker game. So it's the only game on this list I'm not going in completely blind with. And that's why its position is at the very beginning. I'm not going to rationalize the position of games in this video, as generally I just kind of looked at the list and went, yeah, makes sense. But this is undoubtedly the game I'm going to cover first, exclusively because it's the one I'm the most knowledgeable about, hence the game I can draw the most comparisons with and not sound like a complete and utter dumbass. And to be completely blunt, although it's not my favorite game on this list, it's a really good one. It's free, and hell, it's directly inspired some of the greats. It was my introduction to this morbid curiosity and why we're here now. So if you like this video at all, blame this game. It started everything. Booting up the game, you get a warning, and again, there's a reason I included that Star Wars bit at the beginning, and you get to enter your name. The thing is, this is a game where you're going to heavily benefit from putting your real name in. Not Davy Gunface, not Ass Blaster 9000, just Davy. Or Jeff, maybe even Tyler. I know you're fucking watching this, Tyler. Go back to watching NASCAR. Anyways, despite what I just said, please note that if an RPG Maker game asks for your name, that is a fucking trap. And I don't mean walking around Cyrodiil with heavy armor and having two arrows deflect off of your heavy armor trap. I mean getting multiple concussions by that one pink-haired anime guy swinging his cock at your skull at terminal velocity level trap. You're either going to get your character brutally killed with your name, all the while characters directly mention you while torturing you, or they're going to directly mention you by destroying the fourth wall and asking you what the fuck you're doing. This time it's the latter, as you're going to see. And you get directly assigned to a being called the Batter, who is a Batter and you have to make sure that their mission is accomplished. Once you finally start playing the game, you get dropped into Zone Zero, along with a pretty dramatic name drop and a tutorial on how to move. One thing that you're going to notice pretty immediately is how unique this art style is. I've always been an extremely big advocate for pixel art, because I don't exactly think it's a controversial opinion to think that art direction and art style means a whole lot more than, you know, just sheer graphical power. With games looking more and more and more and more realistic by the year, there's always going to be a level of love and affection for those 8 and 16-bit games that I honestly don't think is ever going to go away. And is this a hot take? I would consider this a Sub-Zero take utmost. But I'm bringing this up because all these games are pixel art. And all these games I feel have very unique, recognizable, and lovable art styles. Off is probably the most bare-bones and default-looking one of the bunch, and even then it still runs with what it has in hell. When we get to the combat encounters, there are some great fucking designs there. Anyways, this is, like, dangerously off-topic, even for me, so let's go ahead and get back to the game. Here's a cat. He meows a big meow and immediately breaks the fourth wall by acknowledging the fact that I'm a player. Sort of like a puppeteer, I can't exactly interact with the inhabitants or the things in this world, but since we now have the batter and we understand each other, now I sort of can. This very sudden and immediate fourth wall break sets the tone of the game very well. Anyways, let's talk about the judge. Despite meowing a big meow, he is very verbose. Do you know that type of guy who gets into an online argument and has a dictionary on the other window, just fucking constantly searching up synonyms that are very, very big words to try and sound smarter in a debate. It kind of reminds me of that. Although unlike those people, he's very likable because he's a cat and does cat things and has cat mannerisms. Anyways, here's the game's first puzzle. And I hate to say it, but they kind of suck. And not in the old RPG style where you have to figure out some obscure horseshit to get past an arbitrary puzzle. You don't gotta defeat a snake by throwing a bridle on it so it turns into a horse, but more so the contrary, they're painfully easy. Exploring the map and see a bold letter? Write that shit down. Or alternatively, if you have the memory skills past that of an ADHD third grader playing Gears of War, just do that instead. Just fucking remember the numbers. Oh no, there's a whole bunch of doors? When you get close to it, there's a very, very high increase in volume. Do you have ears? If you don't, Fuck it, that doesn't even really matter. I decided to allocate absolutely zero brain cells into figuring out puzzles, and even by just running into doors over and over and over again, I figured out in like 
maybe two minutes at most. Anyways, let's go ahead and get into zone one. You access it by this overworld map that's very fucking creepy with a song called Silencio. It's nothing but cryptic whisperings that rise in volume that has yet to be translated despite this game being old enough to play Fortnite. It's really fucking ominous and I love it. Going into zone one, everything is fucking weird. All the inhabitants seem very timid and strange. All the while you're given a history lesson on this world that is very similarly weird. This zone in particular has a lot of smoke mines. Smoke is what everybody seems to breathe, so laborers are sent into deep tunnels to mine minerals and free smoke from pockets of gas so that everyone can breathe. This is also portrayed by the clip that plays whenever they talk. Everybody in this game has a little sound clip whenever you interact with them, like for example the judge and it's purring. So when you interact with these people, this delightful clip plays. It's pretty neat. Anyways, after this you get your first add-on, and honestly, I really, really like them. So unlike other RPGs where you'll either have a pool of preset party members you can have with individual personalities, or even a smaller group of party members with more fleshed out identities and motivations, and off you have add-ons. They're circles. And oddly, I think that's perfect for this game. You aren't really thinking about how your party members will react to events or keeping their interests in mind. They're circles. Although I prefer to think of them as onion rings. Or maybe even hula hoops. Point is they're circles. Anyways, you get your add-on and get into your first fight. And this is where most channels would probably talk about combat. But instead I'm going to talk about the music. Let me be blunt, I am not a musically informed person by any stretch of the imagination. I couldn't tell you what the fuck a light motif is, other than the fact that I think there's one in the Elder Scrolls. Really, my taste in music is probably the most primal you can get. I like it when I hear a song and song makes brain feel something. Holy fuck, is that an ice cream truck? This is literally the only time the fucking ice cream truck has come this year and it comes when I'm talking about music? Holy shit. Anyways, uh, when it comes to OSTs, I pretty much have two criteria on whether or not it's great or goes in the apathy part of my brain. Do I listen to the soundtrack outside of playing the game, and do I envision myself doing gay little head bops to it at 3am? If the answer to both of those are yes, it's a good fucking soundtrack. Off has a really good fucking soundtrack. It has a good mixture of haha look at the ridiculousness. Depressive, yeah, this is kind of fucked. And oh shit, oh fuck, oh god damn it, something is going on, songs. It's all very cool and I appreciate it immensely. Anyways, on to the thing I probably should have talked about combat. The combat kind of fucking blows. But I think that's okay. You're not ever going to find yourself playing RPG Maker games for the grand strategy. Out of all the games in this video, there's only one in which I actually had to think out moves and strategize how I was going to use resources and yada yada. RPG mechanics. And although I give it as a huge compliment to that game when we get to it, I don't know if I would necessarily bog down any of these games for its combat, if that makes sense. It's serviceable. For this game in particular, if you go out of your way to do the side content or grind for cool items or moves, you're going to very, very quickly trivialize this game. When I got to the end of the game, I was about level 20, I think. And that was pretty easy. I was clicking auto every battle and steamrolling everything as if I was playing a poorly designed auto battler. But this game actually scales all the way up to level 45. And I don't mean in, like, a strange RPG way where they lock away some stupid secret OP move at the very highest level of the game. No, this game actually progresses and gives you new elements and ailments and new abilities all the way up to 45. Which is fucking baffling because I imagine at that point you're going to be every battle in the game in one move or less because this game does not scale. It almost makes me think near the end there was plans for a new game plus system, or maybe at the very end they realized the game was too easy and significantly crippled the amount of EXP you got. But whatever it is, it's strange, and I wouldn't be able to tell you. 
Anyways, cows. You need them, but not for meat. You see, Polly, they have a whole lot of metallic rocks in their cadavers, so people will split them open in two to get the metal out. The poor quality metal is discarded, which forms the ground you walk on. And the high quality metal is used for metal purposes. Because without metal, people would have nothing to walk on and they would drown. The logic seems fit to me. You gotta kill the specters. And despite what I said earlier about how piss easy the combat is, that isn't going to stop me from loving the enemy designs. There's a very solid mix of strange, mischievous, horrifying, and batshit insane that I really enjoy. And even the enemies you would expect to have a lot of design overlap, such as the specters you fight throughout the entire game, all have very different approaches and designs that I adore. I really enjoy just running around the area and seeing all the enemy designs at least once or twice in every area. And the amount of RPGs that can make me enjoy random encounter spamming is not exceptionally high. Anyways, you get your interaction with this fellow, who objectively has a design. His more detailed one you see later on is pretty cool, even if the overworld one is meh. But what I like the most about him is that he actually used to directly inspire Papyrus from Undertale, specifically his beta design and characteristics. Now I'm going to say outright, I am in no way, shape, or form going to cover Undertale or Deltarune in any of these videos, mostly because it is virtually impossible to have a unique voice or take in the billions and trillions and quintillions of Undertale videos out there. But I wanted to bring it up because I think it's hilarious how much of complete polar opposites they are, in pretty much every way. We fight some more enemies, explore to get some more loot, and we meet the shopkeeper Zachary. This guy tends to be a fan favorite just because of how fucking goofy and meta he is. Also, Tumblr is just fucking obsessed with him. I don't know what it is, I don't know why, but I looked up Zachary off in Google Image Search and holy fucking shit. More puzzles, more enemies, you see this guy again briefly before he tells you to fuck off. Puzzles, war. So we got smoke and metal, up next on the four avatar elements is meat. You're swimming for meat. But just like metal, it actually is used for a real life purpose. Eating. So that's nice for once. Without meat, people would have nothing to eat, so they would devour each other. Pretty sound logic yet again. Also plastic. Plastic is the ocean, and you got plastic, you got meat, metal, and smoke. It's definitely a list of elements. There's a duck. It's specifically a pedalo, but it's a duck. Make sure to write down the big bold numbers, you're gonna need those. Oh no, doors. After the dark souls of puzzles, you fight Day Don. Or Day Dan. If Bloons Tower Defense 6 has taught me one thing, I am not going to fucking pronounce French names correctly. Since I've been doing a lot more exploring and item scavenging, this boss is actually pretty easy. For better and for worse, the boss battles are genuinely really great when you don't do any exploring. Which kind of sucks for a reason you're about to see. After defeating him, you automatically exit Zone 1, signifying that you purified it. You get a little cutscene with a strange baby being concerned. Don't know what that's about. And you go back to the overworld. But Zone 1 is still there. I'm sure many, such as myself, might not pay too much mind to this initially. Maybe it's a technical error or graphical bug. Or maybe it's just there just in case you missed an item and you want to backtrack to get it. But no, it's none of those things. You enter it, and oh fuck. Oh no. Oh damn. This isn't right. This isn't right at all. Yeah, so another common thematic in RPG Maker games. Are you playing the good guy? You'll do actions because you're playing a game. And to beat the game, you kind of need to play through the game and listen to what the game tells you to do. And usually, unlike yourself, who could just close the game and or leave, your actions have very, very real impact on the characters in this world. And although that's kind of a no-brainer for pretty much any RPG out there, this one makes it a more common theme by completely excluding the typical good path and making the dark path, aka the one you're going down by default, extremely not good. And also has a tendency to pin the blame on you, the player, instead of just your character. Personally, I've always loved this in games. 
And although it's debatable whether or not it's a good thing it's so prevalent across an entire genre, as compared to an outlier such as Doki Doki Literature Club or Spec Ops The Line, I still love it and I'm always down to see more. Anyways, back to the game. The world is devoid of color. The soundtrack is haunting with nothing more than an offbeat melody, loud thuds and cries for help, most of the puzzles are entirely solved, there's nobody there, and you're just going around the place seeing what's left. Nothing survives in this world. Even small things like posters have been changed to show absolutely nothing. The only thing you will find in this world is the occasional item and these very fucking strange and powerful enemies that will completely screw you over if you're not prepared. My one and only gripe with it is if you go through these as you're unlocking them, you're going to come into the next zone excessively overpowered. I think the intended progression was something like Zone 1, Zone 2, back to Zone 1, Zone 3, Zone 2, Zone 3. But if you're doing this the second you unlock it, it's going to be a struggle, sure, but you're also going to be completely overleveled and overgeared for the rest of the game. Also, this is entirely optional. You can beat the entire game without even knowing this exists. Which I enjoy, because I don't think there should be a mandatory segment to go through a zone or multiple zones, but simultaneously if you do skip this or never even knew it exists, it does significantly soften the blow of the later parts of the game. There is something you get if you go through every purified zone, but that'll be best saved for later. Let's get out of here and head to zone 2. I know I spent a lot of time on zone 1 exclusively thus far, but I think I've covered all of my bases to run down the rest of the game fairly quickly. Zone 2 starts off with a pretty basic puzzle where you have to fill in pages from ripped books, with one even being found in the overworld. This isn't the fucking Elder Wilds level puzzle solving, but it's at least nice to have a puzzle better than numbers go burr. Doing this puzzle we get to talk to this little guy. He's the leader of the nearby specters and he's also a cat. Granted, one that's not exceptionally strong for the time being, despite his very verbose threats. Defeating him, in air quotes, means you can progress to a new area. The nearby shopping mall. There's a whale in the shopping mall. How does that work? Don't fucking ask. After going through the mall, you can now click on a button, get your pedalo, and go to Disney World. But instead of riding rides, most people in the nearby area actually just sit on steel chairs, pretending they're riding the roller coaster instead because it's too scary. Small shit like this is why I love this game. You also get a nice little ducky section where you ride across the area and pick up some loot. Nothing too mind-blowing, mind you, especially since I've already progressed through the purified Zone 1, but I'm never going to be against free healing items. There's also a balloon minigame over here, I know this is a legitimate thing played in real life, but I couldn't tell you it off the top of my head. It was a fun math puzzle and solving it makes this dude upset. And I mean really, really upset. Dude's going for the fucking Arceus aesthetic by sticking his decapitated neck through a fence. This understandably sends the park in turmoil, but you can just go ahead and leave. Although you probably shouldn't if you haven't rode the roller coaster because... I mean, look at this. But you can, you don't have to do anything else here for the main story. I can use my newfound necktie to proceed into the residential area, and Joffit is a bitch. This is probably the one boss in the game you really should kill. While Daydan was kind of an asshole, this dude summons a whole lot of phantoms and if you don't do badder things and kill them, they'll kill the inhabitants. You do not want that. And what provoked this? The fact that the inhabitants weren't sure if the cat was talking to them. This isn't fucking America, you can't just kill people out of the slightest inconvenience. You go ahead and save them, all the while this pretty fucking sick song plays in the background. It's probably my favorite in the entire game. I used to listen to it a lot back in the olden days of... 2013. Dude, holy shit, that was nine years ago, what the fuck? Anyways, I digress. We help the inhabitants and even pick up some loot from some locked vaults nearby. But afterwards, they told us, despite the fact they're very thankful for me saving their lives, I have a bat, and that's a very dangerous weapon. These guys are very far from thrill seekers, so we have to go ahead and leave. So let's go ahead and find Joffet. Joffet is on top of the tower, and the setup is pretty neat. You start fighting him, and it was just as pathetically easy as before. But the more damage you do, the more that you find that this bird starts to come out of his mouth. 
And after enough damage, he has his Final Fantasy transformation. And then the real game begins. Again, since I've been doing so much side content, this isn't anything that just spamming non-stop attacks won't solve. And I'm not even sure if that line makes sense, I feel like there's a double negative in there somewhere that means I had a hard time with it. But at least anecdotally, I remember this being a pretty difficult fight on my first playthrough. The key thing to note here is that this cat? That's actually the judge's brother. Which is completely depressing because after this battle we can go back to the purified zone and find the judge desperately meowing out into the abyss trying to find him to no avail. Which is just the level of depression I like to see in these games. Speaking of which, there's another cutscene with the baby. Yet again growing more and more concerned as yet another zone is purified. Speaking of which, we can go ahead and go through this purified zone, and it's a little bit harder than the last one. There's a lot more avenues to explore and a lot more hidden items. As well as the only living being who remains in all of the purified zones. We have to get here to get the super cool purified zone item, mind you. So you are directed to find him, but in a weird way it's almost eerie to see a normal... ...ish person in this completely colorless dead husk of a world. Also, I accidentally fought the secret boss, I guess. So if you go back to Zone 1, you can go into that room that had the numbers and letters in it, and fight a secret boss. Her name is Sugar, and statistically at least, she should be the hardest fight in the entire game. But she has one very glaring weakness. Poison. And honestly, this kind of ruins the entire fight. Because as long as poison is applied and I keep myself alive, she will die insanely quickly. Not even the traditional poison way of, oh, you have to survive 20 turns in order for the percentage health damage to eventually whittle away her health bar. She died in like 3 minutes. That's only about 20 seconds longer than the first boss of the game. And I was in no way, shape, or form prepared for this fight. I haven't went through Zone 3, meaning I don't have my third add-on, I don't have any of the related experience, none of the gear. I should not have been able to win this. Was pathetically easy because of poison. But that's neither here or there. Outside of the experience, I don't get a whole lot out of this fight until the next zone anyways, so... Eh. Let's head there now. To be honest, I'd consider Zone 3 to be the worst of the zones. Mostly because it's a lot of annoyances and squashed potential. Firstly, the quote, puzzle at the beginning just sucks. It's not hard at all from a logistical standpoint, you just follow a map, but the map doesn't perfectly align with the grid-based movement well, so sometimes moving a square too far will send you back to the beginning. Which wouldn't be completely awful on its own, but it's the fact that you have to get sent into a random encounter first, and then get sent back to the beginning, which makes it tedious. We do get our last hula hoop though, so we got our gang ready for action. Also, mandatory, entirely unrelated, and irrelevant minigame time. Can't be an RPG Maker game without a random, zany minigame. Anyways, the big thematic of the zone is seeing the sheer depravity and volatile nature of its residents. And for the first time in this game, they actually fight back against the Spectres. And if you thought Arceus over here wasn't having a good day, some of these guys are really, really not. And the reason I think this is squash potential is that we get the fifth element here. Sugar. Sugar is intended to essentially be a drug, as corpses are burnt and converted into sugar, and is used to reward workers in a zone. And many are severely addicted to it. As you saw earlier, they have a tendency to get very violent when it's threatened, and the ambience here is fucking incredible. It takes everything I loved about the creepiness of the last few zones, and compounds it to create a very unsettling zone where I felt disturbed just walking through the silent, tense halls. Even if I was completely alone in that hallway with absolutely no threat. But that great unsettling nature tends to not lead up to anything or lead to an appropriate conclusion. I mean the main boss of this zone is just a complete goofball. A misguided goofball who doesn't know the wrongs he's doing, but still a goofball. Am I asking for some Five Nights at Freddy's jump scares? Not really, but the general anxiety and dread going through this zone is a lot less impactful when nothing really happens. Even in the purified zone, there's a lot of potential for the general uneasiness to be raised another level or two or a hundred. But it's the same exact layout as the other two. And if the purified zones needed some mixing up, it'd probably be best to do it here. You can absolutely run wild with some batshit enemy design, or level layouts, or... 
really anything. This is the one zone in which the inhabitants are actually threatening. And it's just completely the same. Another game I'll talk about later does this fantastically, but we'll get there when we get there. There's also this game's first and sadly only real meta puzzle. In the readme files there's a quote, cheat code to unlock every item. Of course that doesn't work, but it is used here in order to progress the story. It's far from the most clever meta puzzle we'll cover, but hell, it's nice to finally have that fourth wall broken down yet again. Also, here's the boss of the zone. He exists, I guess. Bat his head off. Purified zone is the exact same. Next chapter. The room starts with some major no-no spooky antics. There's chairs moving around, rooms generally not leading to where they're supposed to, and all the while you're getting exposition through notes left behind a child. Presumably the one you've been seeing in cutscenes. Also teddy bears. Sadly by this point in the game my team is a well-oiled machine of death, so really no enemy can get close to even touching me. But regardless there's some more chair fuckery with a smiley face turning into a frowny face, and there's now a door. Going through the door, everything becomes very crude. Going from the traditional smooth and straight pixelated walls and hallways to what can only be described as a child trying their best to scribble out a hallway in ghosts. This theory only expands when you leave and go back to the starting room and the game actually goes back a chapter, going from 5 to 4. Returning to a child's room yet again the hallway is now actually done being drawn, and you get to go through a segment where you get to talk to the guardians of all three zones. It's actually very heartwarming. You get to talk to all the zone's leaders before you bash their skulls in, and before they're the leader of... anything, really. It's cute. And the amount of games I can call talking to a tall, decrepit man who speaks and screeches in an abandoned shack by a dark and gloomy cliffside cute... is not exceptionally high. Then Chapter 3 begins. The World in a Window. And this is probably my favorite part of this entire game. You get booted to the main menu and have the option between three saves, each of which are fucked in their own unique way, and you have to figure out how to get past them all. There's an order you should do them in, and a few people you need to talk to in all of them, and the creativity shown in this one chapter alone really makes me depressed that for the most part of this game's puzzles were big number go burr. There's also a ton of hidden and unique items you can get in this one chapter, and they're all really fun to find. But afterwards is chapter 2, which is objectively a chapter. I wish this was just cut or made optional. You went from some of the best puzzles this game had with ingenious solutions to haha, baseball man go brrrr. Afterwards though is chapter 1. But first though we have to go back to zone 0. Since we got all the items in every zone, I can now get my choice of the best weapon in the entire game, or a shitty joke item that only leads to a bad joke ending because it's haha <laughs> quirky laugh. I went for the former for footage's sake, but just choose the bat. Anyways, back to chapter 1. We have to fight this woman, and sadly this entire sequence struggles immensely because of initial translation errors. Like I said at the beginning, this game was made in the bad language. So when it was translated, there were a few errors. And while some may have been inconspicuous and minor at worst, the ones found here actually changes the end of the game and its impact entirely. From what I could tell, the sequence goes from your wife and your child, to the child being the one that made you, but in a strange way, you're still his mom and dad. It's weird? And honestly, I don't even know if I got it right. But you know what I can get right? Domestic abuse. Anyways, Chapter Zero. Do you know what I can do a lot better than domestic abuse? Child abuse. In all seriousness though, this is the person that has created the entire world, and why the translation errors are a lot more fucked because this game story is all because of this kid. And that's why the entire world is so messed up. It's all child's imagination. It's also evident that this child is ill, as evidenced by the fact that he hardly ever moves, coughs constantly, and seems generally depressed. One neat thing about this though is that he actually has 9,999 of what this game would consider mana. I believe it's competence points, however it usually goes for the abbreviated version and text, and I'm not going to fucking save this while talking about a kid. I could go really, really deep into theories here, but do you know what I could go even deeper into? 
This kid's fucking skull. Dear God, this child is goddamn tanky. My onion rings are smashing into him with the velocity of jet planes, and he's just sitting there tanking it like it's nobody's business. Eventually, though, we kill the child. And this is where we get to choose one of two endings. You go into this room and... So you get called out. And the judge is generally pretty unhappy to say the least. And says everything that everybody probably thinks. The fact that the world is destroyed, you did absolutely nothing right, and you just killed your wife and child, etc. This setup is severely weakened if you never went back to any of the optional purified zones, but you should at least know that by the very end, beating and or killing your wife and child isn't exactly seen as favorable deeds in society. Unless you live in America, in which it's pretty cool. However, this is in America. And at the very least, although the choice is ultimately pointless, as there is absolutely nothing to return to, you can join up with a judge and kill the batter, ending his mission in the last steps before true victory, or join the batter and kill the judge to finally beat the mission you were set out on from the very second you start the game. I go for the former in most cases, because honestly the sprite is just fucking metal. Look at him dude, he turned into a goddamn Velociraptor. All the while this song starts playing that's equally menacing, and kind of a fucking bop, I don't know what it is, but it just goes in. Anyways, we have to give him an aneurysm. In fact, literally every single special move you can use is just excruciatingly violent, and they're all based on brain, neck, and spinal damage. I don't know why, but hitting somebody with moves like aneurysm rupture and staggering sclerosis is just really fucking cool to me, and I'm not going to pass that up. Besides that point, however, inflicting aneurysms tend to do a lot of damage, as is shown by my average viewer. And we kill the Velociraptor with ease. And despite the fact that everything is lost, and there's nothing left of this world, in this route this is still preferred over his victory, no matter how obsolete, and hence nothing remains except for our regrets. Except not really guys, there's funny space monkeys! <laughs> Anyways, that's the first game down, and hopefully we're making good progress in time. Shit. Yeah, let me go ahead and wrap up my thoughts on this game. This game is very near and dear to me, as it was my first introduction to a genre of games that I adore multiple titles of now. But would I recommend it? If you watched up to this point in the video, probably not. This is one of those games where you go in blind and come out of the other side like, Whoa, that was pretty neat. And then you join an obscure forum online and some random website and post about the game with a group of like-minded individuals and everybody just thinks you're fucking weird. That's most RPG Maker games, actually. Point is, if you got to this point in the video, you probably spoiled yourself on everything that's special about this game. And honestly, I know this is asking for a bit much, but if this game had an unofficial or even an official remaster, Fixing the extremely bizarre level and enemy scaling and refining the puzzles a bit more, I'd be able to recommend this wholeheartedly because in terms of actually playing the game, there just isn't really a whole lot there. And I should probably clarify because I say this about a lot of games in this video, I'm really not looking for some darkest dungeon death march where I have to min-max my characters to their highest potential and have a game plan utilizing status conditions, party healing, and resource management for every fight. But when you're playing a turn-based RPG, combat is just going to inherently be a lot more time-consuming. So when the combat isn't engaging, or completely trivial, it just means you're wasting more and more time fighting tedious battles and not doing what players want to be doing. And in tandem with a lot of random encounters and bosses that should make you have a no shit moment upon fighting them, what you have is just really boring and actually really negatively impacts your game far more than you would probably expect. But the world building, and especially the OST, is fantastic. The characters, although extremely simple, are also memorable and lovable. And the story is as obscure as it is interesting. And the puzzles, for the most part, are extremely middling. But the last chapter is genuinely really interesting and shows the utmost potential a game with this concept has. Really barring this, the ending of this game is just really great. Off is just very flawed. Very good, I'd argue fantastic even, but... 
flawed. I wouldn't recommend it if you watched this point, but if you have a friend who has a passing interest in the game, it's definitely worth a shot. So let's go ahead and move forward to least the painful. Now to be blunt, before we begin, I need to start this with a bit of a history lesson on Lisa. Or more specifically, Lisa the First. Lisa the First was a more psychological horror themed RPG maker game where you play as Lisa. And it's child abuse, it's, it's just fucking child abuse. Your dad is named Marty and after his wife died he very quickly turned into a depraved alcoholic with seemingly no redeemable qualities. And you, as Lisa, don't get to have a really good fucking time. What starts off as shouting anytime you try to leave your lifeless, featureless, run-down room very, very quickly devolves into disturbing shit. Now, I could be wrong on this, but I believe she was beaten and molested constantly, and after she starts seeing nothing but her abusive father, the more she tries to escape her situation, she fucking hangs herself. That's why I didn't cover this game, because as revolutionary of a take as don't abuse children is, I'm not really fond of the misery porn. Literally this entire game would just be me recapping story events, which is probably fine for anybody who hasn't played the game. But for you and me, I'd rather just recap the overall game in a few paragraphs and skip the least of the painful. Which title screen features Lisa, who is still not having an exceptionally good time. If you think this game is going to start off less morbid... Nah. Uh, this is Brad. Brad is Lisa's brother. And overall, Brad feels very, very guilty over Lisa's suicide and wishes that he could have done more to save her. And he feels an unequivocal hatred towards Marty and an unequivocal remorse for Lisa's death. Again, this is a really, uh, a dark setup. However, if you think this is the entire RPG, you're very, very wrong. As immediately after this, you flash forward many years and get put into a world after an event known as the White Flash. This event is pretty simple. One day, the Flash happened and eradicated every single woman on Earth. And this setup, despite its strangeness, sets the tone in the world up very well. Now before it's inevitably brought up, yes I know transgender people exist, I know sexuality exists, and yada yada, and they're cool, I like that. But the point of this event is very simple. The human race is doomed. With reproduction off the table, humanity has a predetermined set amount of time of existence before eventually the last guy dies. And that's that. There's nothing else to do. And I'm sure people have really nitpicked this concept to hell and back, but don't overanalyze this. There's a lot of shit to come that requires that more. Back to what I was saying, after the flash happens, you come across a baby. Now other than the concern that you just randomly found a baby out in the middle of fucking nowhere, which is already fucking strange seeing how every woman on earth is dead, this baby is also a woman. In a world full of nothing but men. That's not particularly fucking good. Because this makes her the target of very literally every single fucking man on the planet. So Brad being the one to find her is simultaneously great in the fact that he is going to be immensely protective of her. But it's also not a fantastic thing because he's going to inherently be very limited in his thought process over the death of Lisa. So this goes on a few years and Brad is immensely overprotective of this child, who was eventually named Buddy, to a fault. In a lot of ways mirroring his father. And you can't really fault the guy, as you're going to see this caution and anxiety is going to be very much warranted as one day Brad wakes up to find that she's kidnapped, and most if not all of my friends have been outright killed or beaten up relentlessly. But not before you wake up from an alcohol and do sleep and rescue this guy named Terry Hint from a puppy named Cheeselegs. Yeah, this game is going to have just as much zany and strange as dark and traumatic. Why do I keep saying traumatic? This is the second recording in a row I failed this. Whatever, talking to him reveals that his name is Terry Hints. He's generally pretty full of himself. He gives hints and... Wait, what, what, what the fuck did I just do? Uh, Shit. I just activated pain mode. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you what this mode does. It's recommended for players on a repeat playthrough. I am very much not a player on a repeat playthrough. And what it does is it makes every save point expendable, only being able to be used once, some more different and difficult enemies, as well as a secret ending. Now I'm sure most people will just restart here, but... Fuck it. I'm a sucker for pain, let's see how this goes. 
So, yeah, sorry for that sidetrack, I just had to mention it. Everybody's dead, Buddy is gone, let's go find her. After a bit of traveling and combat, we get jump scared by a car. And here comes the first really difficult choice in the game. Either you let him kill Terry, or he steals all of your belongings. The obvious choice here is letting him kill Terry. But here's the thing. He is fucking worthless. I mean, very blatantly, he's god-awful. But, if years of playing turn-based RPGs like this have taught me anything, worthless piece of garbage characters like Terry will, at some point in the late game, become a near-godlike deity. I'm sure there's an archetype named specifically for this type of character, but that does end up being the case as he very literally has the most powerful move in the entire game. So, yeah. We let him take our stuff and we're on our merry way. We get another party member, proceed to a nearby factory, and... Okay, so let's talk about Joy. Joy is a drug used in game that simultaneously makes you feel nothing, yet also many claim that it makes you feel good. You can use it in combat to get rid of your Joy withdrawals, and it's generally an uber powerful buff you're heavily pushed to use in difficult fights. But that's the thing right there. Joy is an incredibly addictive drug, and Brad hasn't been against using it before. The first thing you see Brad in after the time skip is him contemplating using it or not. And although it makes you feel nothing, it also impacts you psychologically and increases your violent tendencies. As seen in battle, with the damage increase. And on the withdrawal note, also seen in battle because every now and then, you'll have a withdrawal and it makes your next few attacks do absolutely no damage. However, that isn't the worst effect of joy. And we'll get into that much, much later. We push forward and there's a guy here telling us if we fall off a cliff enough, we get a cool karate move. So... Sure, why not? We return to town, do some more antics, and... Yeah, outside of the premise you're going to see a lot of visions of your dad and Lisa. They're all pretty ominous, but luckily for us, none of them are jump scares. If you remember what I talked about in Off specifically in Zone 3, this is the general uneasiness that I enjoy. Eventually, you make your way towards the first crossroads. The crossroads is something used very heavily in Lisa, and it's generally how your progression is marked. For the painful, you're going to have a crossroads 1, crossroads 2, and crossroads 3. And honestly, you're pretty heavily incentivized to back goddammit cliffs. Look, I had a paragraph here describing how much I dislike cliffs, but essentially can boil down to one sentence. If you suffer from crippling ADHD like me, and cannot go more than two seconds without pressing a button, you are very likely to fall off a cliff at one point and instantly die, which is annoying because saves are infrequent, especially in hard mode. That's it. Fucking gravity. Also, here's the boss battle I did first. Although I don't know if it's strictly a boss battle, but I think it is. Either way, it was a pretty brutal fight, but I managed to barely finish it with Brad being my only survivor. And after a few more pretty easy encounters throughout the rest of this area, we can get a bunch of firebombs, which are really heavily incentivized to use against this guy right here, in a different area of the crossroads. You need to kill him to get the bike, both for progressing the story and because it's a massive fucking convenience. I also died here after running away from him with barely any health and getting into a random encounter with a snake. So I lost a bit of progress there, but eventually I came back better than ever, and even with a new party member. So let's begin our battle. This right here is a Joy Mutant. We'll discuss them in more depth way later, although their name makes it pretty blatant on what they are. They're scary. This one isn't too bad, but they're a lot more frequent later on in the game, and they will fucking decimate you if you aren't prepared. We use our firebombs against him, get the bike, and the cool thing about the bike is this jump right here. This means you can jump over short ledges, meaning you have more areas to backtrack to, but it also makes more areas accessible. There's actually a genuinely great piece of game design as soon as you unlock it that's brought up fairly frequently in analysis videos. So the second you unlock this, you're supposed to go the right. You can't go to the left. 
And you're not exactly going to fucking fly, so go the right. And if you hold down right, which you probably are, your character automatically does a little jump. And that's supposed to show the player, oh cool, you can jump over ledges now. And that opens their mind to areas that they want to go to, or maybe even areas they passed over already that they still want to go to. But instead, I did this. Who even cares about level design anyways? Anyways, after obtaining the bike, I go on a few mini-adventures. I found this guy in particular, and I used a joy pill to defeat him, because my last save was before that fight, and also before the encounters and getting to him, and fuck it, I'm not going to do that again. I didn't really use this party member much, and there's nothing notable about this encounter, other than the fact that I, as a player, chose to use joy. So keep that in mind. Foreshadowing. The rest of the crossroads are smaller little adventures, and outside of specific segments, I'm going to generally keep their length pretty brief, because unlike a game like Off where there's only a few very curated zones, this game has a lot more. Although their quality and themes tend to be very sporadic, and the whole lot of them don't really have a whole lot to discuss about. Which I am going to say outright is a good thing. This game is unlike its predecessor in effect, which is a lot of ridiculous, a lot of fun, and zany. However, for this video in particular, there's not really a whole lot to get into, so... Yeah. It's just better off to address the important parts. Here's the President's Hair Club. They're very hard. And again, just like the Joy Mutant, you're going to really want fire bombs to kill this off. I didn't have any, and I died. So I needed to backtrack and get some more stuff. And here's something I really want to say. This game's balancing is fucking fantastic. Although the variety of party members inherently means there are just some that are way more OP than others, due to how common party death is in this game, you're usually not going to roll with just one OP party unless you know the game's consequences and or save scum. Are there OP combos? Yeah, I'm gonna be honest, I kind of min-maxed my team towards the end on accident. But that's not really what I want to talk about. Because this kind of directly ties into the thing I love the most. The items and item management. Items in this game are massively important. And they're generally pretty scarce. So you usually unlock them through backtracking, going through optional areas, enemies, etc. And this goes along with the game's currency. Even with my stupidly OP min-max team, I was struggling to get any more than 300 magazines. Which really isn't a whole lot when you look at the shops. Because of this, healing is also massively important because you're never really given an overabundance of items. And this directly correlates with resting. You're not just given a button that restores your health. There are set locations in the world to rest, and those have a lot of random encounters. That can range from inconveniences, something bad a la losing your party members, something scary, and something completely fucking awful. I believe in the entire game there's only one location in the entire game that is 100% safe to use infinitely, but I believe that's a glitch. So instead, you're heavily incentivized to sleep in inns. When sleeping out in the wild can sometimes cost you a party member, or have this shit happen, I was more than willing to go out of my way for minutes at a time just so I could know I can stay safe and not have a party member die or... This is off script, but there's a random percent chance when you sleep the entire screen will turn black until you rest again or quit the game and holy shit... No. And also entirely off topic again, but I just fucking adore percent chance things to happen in video games. Something like Doki Doki where Every person's gonna have their own little story of something that creeped them out, or was weird, or what have you. I don't know what it is, but I'm always more of an ecstatic to see them in video games. Anyways, the point I'm getting at here is that the item management in this game is impeccable. And I say constantly throughout this video, you don't really play these games for balanced experiences. But this is like genuinely one of the best designed RPGs I've ever played? Which is strange, because this happens. My one and only big complaint is, is that there's areas in every crossroads where you can easily farm infinite magazines and experience at a shockingly high rate. I know why it needed to exist, 
And honestly, I'm removing two paragraphs from the script of this video exclusively because saying it out loud, I could very well be in a minority with this opinion, especially since permadeath is a pretty frequent occurrence later on. And ultimately, if it cheapens your experience, you can just entirely opt out of doing this. But I don't know what it is. Whenever I see guides that explicitly recommend that you do this for a few minutes just so the early game is easier, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting dangerously close to the Dark Souls difficulty debate territory. And to be fucking honest, I already hate debate bros. And if there's one topic I know debate bros love in video games, it's just jerking each other off about video game difficulty, so fuck it. I'm gonna put my thoughts on screen. If you wanna read through a few paragraphs, you can. I'd rather not dilute the video with this, and especially since I'm discussing the exact contrary in a later game, so... Yeah. After returning to the hair club and completely decimating them, we unlock the truck keys, which gives us a very easy way to backtrack to any previous or current crossroads. And after another extremely difficult boss fight, thanks to pain mode, we find one of our friends extremely wounded, tie him up, and ask him where Buddy is. This is where Brad's violent tendencies due to joy really start to pop up as you ruthlessly beat this man for answers. And after continued silence, you begin beating him with a club. And eventually he begs for you to stop and tells you where she is, but you don't relent and keep beating him over and over and over again until you mercilessly kill him. Fun. Also immediately after this, more pain. Here's Buzzo. And now you have a choice between sacrificing a random party member, who funnily enough was Terry yet again, or your left arm. You also have the option to try and kill him, which isn't going to happen. Although beating him is possible with a preset gameplay and utilizing a bunch of status conditions and items, you have to go extremely out of your way to do that, and even then, if you do manage to defeat him, you just get a game over screen. So, yeah. He wipes to four with us in one move, and fortunately we don't have to go back to the last save. It just pops us right back here to the initial question. I let him cut off my left arm, which decreases my attack and defense, removes all abilities that require my left arm, and makes my joy withdrawals more prevalent and craved. This game fucking sucks. I love it. Here's a funny bike section. Despite having one arm, Brad is more than capable of perfectly driving a motorcycle while simultaneously running over multiple people who dare stand in his way. So that's neat. Anyways, here's Rando. As you can probably tell by the fact I just ran a fucking motorcycle into him and I was the one who got thrown over, he's kind of fucking strong. Despite this though, he actually apologizes and gives us eight of one of the best healing items in the entire game. That's Rando. He's nice, and he'll be very important later. Also, just in case the tragedy hasn't been as excessive recently with your arm getting cut off and violently beating one of your lifelong friends to death, you're now put into a mandatory Russian roulette section where you have to throw your party members into roulette and win a few times before leaving. I don't have any fault with this on paper, but I do want to say I do not advocate for save scumming in this game whatsoever. I think a lot of the themes become dampened when you just go back and save your party members after every death. However, this is kind of the one that I would advocate the most for because it's very easy to lose, you know, four, five, or even six party members in one go, while in other playthroughs you might lose, like, one or two. And unlike the grief you feel when you lose them during a very difficult encounter, or sacrifice, or story reason, this one's just a 50-50. Over, and over, and over again. If it makes sense, I feel like you probably should have had a maximum of, like, three party member deaths at most? The fact that it's very possible for you to lose your entire party and have to redo this entire section all over again anyways... Yeah, I'd advocate for saves coming for this. Not for anything else though, and I do want to clarify... Permadeath is... Permadeath, you're not getting them back. So although I like this segment, especially somebody who tends to prefer the Iron Man runs and tactical strategy games... I think there's just way too many variables and horseshit that can happen for this to be a liked feature of the game. Speaking of which, let's talk about party members' role in the story. Or I guess the lack thereof. Party members in this game are kind of like offs in a way, where despite them having personalities, having unique ways you recruit them, and all of them having unique traits or valuable skills, 
You only really care less about them as individual characters as much as you care about having them in your party and your experiences with them. It's like playing a turn-based strategy game where, yeah, the individual characters don't really motivate you. If Sundry Knight 259 dies, that isn't really all too much of an emotional gut punch. They're like a cardboard cutout of a character. However, when Sundry Knight 259 has been with you for hours and hours, has had individual clutch moments for herself and for other party members, and you've enjoyed utilizing her through your game through thick and thin, and then Sundry Knight 259 dies? Shit, dude, I don't know if Sundry Knight 258 is all that good of a replacement anymore. Anyways, Crossroads 2 is full of quirky moments. I hired a hentai artist for an absurd price, and I never even used him. Then this funny part where I ran over a lot of people with my personal killdozer and... One of the most weirdly emotional fucking fights I've ever had. And then this comic antic. This isn't all too scary, but at 2am in a relatively dark room all by myself? No, I, I didn't like it. There's a mech battle, and here's Wally. He exists. He's revered as a god for serving people fast food, so that's cool, I guess. It's honestly really fucking creepy, and only gets more obscure from here. Your dad is going to be showing up a lot more. There's already been a few trauma-induced flashbacks and hallucinations already, but they're only going to continue more and more and more over time. I'm also going to go ahead and skip straight to Crossroads 3, as there's a lot of points I want to bring up, and I feel like Crossroads 2 doesn't have a whole lot to mention that I can't directly correlate to 3, so... Yeah. You start this Crossroads yet again with a choice. This one is probably the most one-sided, but in a really disturbing way. Here's Buddy. You have your choice between your three party members or her nipple. Practically, the choice should always be the latter. She does have two, and it's your entire party's lives at stake here. But does that make it feel particularly g- No. Or alternatively, if you've been exploring, you could save scum and sacrifice three random donkey party members you are never going to use and keep her chest intact. So, again, I kind of need to bring up save scumming. Just like the infinite grinds, I feel like it kind of ruins the game if you frequently abuse this. In repeat playthroughs, yeah, sure. You're not going to send out your three best party members into the front lines if you know they're going to die in the next segment. But if you do this on your first playthrough, you're going to ruin a lot of what makes it special. Especially if you haven't been paying attention to your reserves or have only been using one preset party. This choice is fucking awful. And I love it. And I can't help but feel that this choice is ruined if instead of the characters you've been loving and utilizing through the entire playthrough are sacrificed, it's just three random fuckwits you have no idea about. That's pretty much all I have to say. After this, there's also a very funny segment that, I won't lie, made me laugh out loud far more than I would like to admit. Just fucking kidding, all of your inventory or your other arm, which one will it be, fuckaroo? Don't bother asking why either, or else both things happen, x d d d d d d d So here's Crossroads 3. Brad is now armless, but that doesn't matter because my team is, uh, fucking insanity. I don't want to dedicate an entire segment to this because it's nitpicky, but if you want to turn this game into a complete cakewalk, just get birdie for stupid cheap and have a team that utilizes gasoline plus fire. Anyways, let's talk about Joy Moons, because there was a segment I left out earlier and one I mentioned briefly that we can now talk about. When you take Joy repeatedly, after a while, you slowly begin your transformation into a Joy Moon, which is an incredibly powerful yet completely deranged being that is a complete abomination. In this transformation, you only have one instinct, 
to enact or indulge in your deepest desires. Which is why a lot of the time after they transform suddenly, they tend to immediately massacre everyone near them and they become frighteningly lethal. And why some are more than content to just sit around relatively harmless. And when I mean lethal, holy shit, I mean lethal. When I mentioned earlier that death becomes more and more frequent over time, although that's already happened with the story, in battle, most late-game mutants have at least one move, if not more, that will instantly kill a party member if it lands. That's not very good. Anyways, on to why this is particularly bad news, bears. Other than the joy that you can take in-game, you're also force-fed joy during a specific segment, and that essentially means one thing. Your transformation is pretty much inevitable now. So have fun avoiding the suicidal football helmet wearing bombers before you take on a stupid football team, Captain, and god fucking damn it, he's here too. Crossroads 3. You have to go down all these areas so you can make a boat. I don't really like skimming over this again, especially after completely glancing over most other segments, but this is essentially a continuation of everything I talked about. Sacrifice and death is going to be a lot more frequent. Enemies are overall significantly scarier, since joy mutants are more common than ever. Your hallucinations of Lisa and your dad get more and more and more common. Your violent outbreaks get more and more disturbing. And listen to that fucking music. Oh yeah, I didn't have a dedicated music segment. It's really good. For Lisa. It fits the tone of the game perfectly, but I don't know if I would recommend more than maybe a quarter for personal listening, unless you're just a shit poster who has a dumb cock and ball torture playlist like I do. Although I think this is in least of a joyful, let's go ahead and take a quick look at a... Uh... 666 Kill Chop Deluxe. What the fuck is happening? Also another song that isn't in this game I don't think, but I think is just beautiful is Broken Tooth March. It's a bop, and I don't know why this is completely off topic, but there's a mix of it with Young Venus from Nuclear Throne, and I just fucking love that game, and god damn it, this song is great. I want to completely derail for a second here, I fucking love Nuclear Throne, I think it's a great game and I'm sad more people don't play it. Anyways, after this, you get your boat, you start going after Buddy, and this is the point of no return once you get on. You're done. No exploring, no grinding, no items. You're all in. I do want to say one thing abruptly, though, and that is, this isn't a complete all-in segment. I mean, you can't go back, but you don't have to worry about being softlocked or being in a difficult scenario or what have you. You're very much not going to die. Anyways, after you get on the island, the person who made and drove the boat? Yeah, he lives up to his looks. You eventually find Buddy, and oh my shit, oh my fuck, it's my dad, and he's with Buddy, and he's still drinking alcohol, and he's looking as depraved as ever, and Buddy is sitting right next to a bunch of joy, oh goddamn fuck, massacre him. Now, this is probably one of my favorite moments in the entire game, as well as pretty much all these games. This fight right here is hardly fair. You're throwing fireballs at your dad all the while he's kicking up dirt and scratching you. And Buddy fucking despises seeing this. She doesn't want you to fight him and runs to protect him. All the while sobbing and begging you not to hurt him. All the while you completely lose the option to attack your dad. If you want to attack him, you have to do what your dad did to you and attack Buddy. She doesn't damage you. Her only attempts at retaliation are crying, guarding, and measly scratches that do no damage. It's fucking dark. I don't say this to shit on off, especially because these two games are radically different, but it takes everything I love about the ending of that game and perfects it. 
Okay, honestly, I don't want to spoil past games when covering current games, but the more I think about it, the more I think these games' endings are comparable in a way. I'm not going to elaborate on that further because, again, you should be able to skip this video and not worry about spoilers or previous segments, but if you know, you know. Eventually, Buddy is out of the way and you finally get to kill your dad. And here's where an interesting hypothetical is kind of directly shoved down your throat. Can you forgive your abusers if they've bettered themselves as people and are no longer who you once hated? I'm not going to answer this question. I'm also not even going to bother gauging with it or providing my two cents. Not out of lack of interest because I've thought about this exact thing before, but... There's a lot of variation. It's too much variation. And although I could go on about my life experiences and my personal thought process, that's not your life. I'm not you, and no matter what I wouldn't be able to personally know you enough to rationalize that as a yes or a no. And even if I did somehow know you enough with the power of parasocial relationships, I'm still in no fucking way qualified to give you an answer. I could really go on and on and on about this one point for way too long, but I'd rather not because ultimately I don't know you and you don't know me, and this is... It's debatable at best, genuinely fucking harmful at worst, so... No. Anyways, afterwards you black out and wake up near the beach, and if you return to your dad, he is just completely tenderized. He's... he's gone. He's... nothing remains. All the more, Buddy stole your boat while you were incapacitated, so you have to improvise on how to get to the last island of the game. I know it's ultimately a very small thing, but your bike not being available in this area and the next is genuinely a very good design decision. Eventually you find Buddy, who is currently getting assaulted by somebody who completely tore out her left eye and permanently and irreparably damaged her face, so that his mark will forever be left on this world. This is only more brutal if you also had her mutilated before, so... yeah. Fun game, right? Eventually you kill him, Buddy runs off again after telling Brad that he took everything from her, that Marty was a better father in a few days than Brad ever was, that Brad was a monster, and you quite literally become a failure. Everything you dreaded about and hated about your dad, you became. But only because you cared and wanted, more than anything else, to be unlike your dad and be a good parent towards Buddy. Afterwards, you get to explore the base a lot more, and this is where the items went from mostly rations and healing items to lots of firebombs and items to deal immense amounts of damage. Then this scene plays out. I love this, and although you're very much given the feeling that this is all or nothing, you are supposed to completely decimate everything in your way, including a literal army of soldiers and all of your friends who got you to where you are. The battle background is an obscure vortex of red and the music starts off pretty upbeat before transitioning into a more dark and somber tune before people start commenting that you're a monster. You're not human. And they mean this very literally. Everybody in the entire world is in the way of Buddy. The one thing you want to protect the most. You're turning into a mutant, and you're given the last two skills in the entire game you'll ever unlock. Cry and scream. With your innumerable amount of firebombs and healing items, you're going to completely decimate everything in your way. And it ends with Rando. He's the last thing that stands in your way of Buddy, and you eventually defeat him too after the first real battle of this entire segment. He's really fucking strong. Afterwards, you have to crawl back to Buddy in which she screams at you everything I've been saying up to this point, and you're given one final option. Hold Brad in his last dying breaths, or ignore his one last wish and let him die truly alone. After you make your choice, a little bit of time passes and the credits begin to roll. And the cool thing about this game is I'm still realizing new shit about it even as I'm scripting. 
Look at the credits. This, this isn't right. This isn't right. And after enough time passes by, you wake up while Brad is transforming into a mutant, and you find Buddy all by herself. You start crawling up to her, a loud noise plays, and the screen fades to black. And this is where you have three potential ending slides that can potentially play out. Potentially. Since I did this in pain mode, we're getting the pain mode ending. In this, you see a child who had his face sawed off viciously and claims it was for Lisa. This is Dusty. And after you leave, he cries out for you, but refers to you not as Master Armstrong, or Brad, but Dad. That is Rando. That is why his face is fucked up. You're a terrible person. The other two endings you can potentially get is if you use Joy, or you play through the entire game without using Joy at all. I'll cover this a little bit more in Least of the Painful, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap up my thoughts. There is a lot I love about this game. There are a lot of RPGs and story-driven games that pride itself in making the main character unlikable and force you to do things that you don't want to do. But this is the game I believe that does it best. I'll be honest, I'm just going to go ahead and link a video in the description of this one, and if you like this at all and you trust my evaluation even the slightest bit, I would highly recommend watching it. It is a great video. I love this game. I love how it deals with sacrifice, how it deals with relationships, how it deals with trauma and abusers, and how it deals with a lot of other very touchy and controversial subjects I feel often get ignored for being too controversial and touchy. And to clarify, that's not exactly a bad thing. I personally love fiction that covers these heavy, heavy topics. But I know I'm not alone when I say that I don't need to mentally prepare myself every time I launch a game. Even if it's a heavily story-based one, I don't want to deal with child abuse and trauma and whatever the fuck this is on a regular basis. But the thing I want to say is that this game does those concepts fantastically. Which is fucking strange because you're going from these heavy topics to whatever the hell this is, or that is, or this thing. But genuinely, if you're interested in playing a game that explores those concepts, I would highly recommend this one a play. I feel like just like a lot of games in this video, you kind of ruined the game for yourself by watching this, especially for the really heavy choices, but unlike Off, I feel like there's enough explorations and decisions between point A and point B to still recommend this. There's still also least of a joyful if you want to play a direct expansion to this, and there's so, so many fan games. I haven't covered fan games in this video, and that's because a lot of them are really good, and I could probably make another video with the equal length to this one on fan games alone. But the point I want to get at is that, at least from what I've heard anecdotally, the fan games for Lisa are particularly pretty good. I wouldn't be able to tell you the best ones, but just do a quick Google search and I'm sure you'll find one. And I swear to god this isn't me algorithming, but if you've actually played any fan games, please let me know which ones are good. Both because I'm interested and there might be others who are, so. I think Off has a couple really good ones too, but this is besides the point. Good game, love how it tackles its subjects, and its really bizarre world building is surprisingly good for what it is. Also, I'm saying this as a bit of parasocial banter, but I am frequently reading through all these 30 minute long scripts just to ensure I'm getting everything right because I've left all these games extremely sentimental. It is fucking inevitable I'm going to miss something or get something wrong if I haven't already, but god damn it, I love all these games and I'm sad because god damn it, I am in no way qualified to talk about these in depth, and I am just me. So after Lisa the Painful is Lisa the Joyful. And I hate to spoil the entire video this early on, but Lisa the Joyful doesn't mean happy. It's not very joyful. Brad isn't going to reanimate back to his human self and go, Yep, let's go to happy fun time land, buddy. We are going back firmly into the Depresso Zone. This is further evidenced by the title screen, which is doing better than ever. With the once lifeless dangling corpse now being completely covered in blood from an unknown amount of time dangling from the noose. Now for a real thinker on this one, the game doesn't immediately start with child abuse. 
Instead, it just really quickly devolves into child abuse. As far as I'm concerned, this is a new fucking record. Buddy is immediately given a message by Brad, and one that isn't necessarily wrong. Brad wants Buddy to be prepared, and the best way for her to be prepared is to know that the world and the people in it are going to be dangerous and cruel. And he teaches her to become numb and be able to take a life at a moment's notice. It's kill or be killed, and he doesn't want his daughter to be weak. If this is just, like, genuinely heart-wrenching to watch unfold, the type of scenario that no child should ever have to go through, but kind of has to in this world? And then the game begins literal seconds before at least the painful ends. And I mean seconds, that's not hyperbole. The first real encounter we have to go through in this game is against Brad, who attacks Buddy. I honestly have no clue why in all truthfulness, but he's doing it. The combat in this game is a lot smoother. You're going to be playing Buddy through the entire thing, obviously, and for better and for worse, she's really fun to control and play. She has a little timing minigame in her attacks that I personally really enjoy seeing, although I wish it was expanded a bit more. Like, for example, the Mario and Luigi series are some of my favorite RPGs to play just because her turn-based strategy is a lot more involved. And as far as I'm aware, this is the only timing-related attack to the entire game, which is absolutely okay. Don't get me wrong, Buddy doesn't need a dedicated jump button so she can avoid swords or pedophiles or whatever. But another timing-based attack or two would have been really nice to see. Once we do enough damage, Buzzo comes down, and for once, he doesn't hurt us. Which is strange, because if you remember in the last game, he wasn't exactly the charitable type. But eventually, we move forward. We unlock our Naruto run, which is essentially a better bike in every way. And we eventually run into some raiders and rando. The raiders threaten us, but just before anything was about to happen, a joy mutant drops down and rando takes us away. One thing that is made clear immediately is that rando thinks Brad didn't want to hurt Buddy and pretty much just wanted to prepare her for this world. This is very much going to be the main thematic of this game, and it's why I actually didn't cover in as much depth as I was going to in The Painful. Because in all truthfulness, if I went fully in depth there, I wouldn't really have a whole lot to talk about here, so... Basic video formatting. Rando's your first, and I hate to say it, only party member. I'll have more to say when we get to combat, but I had to say that immediately. Anyways, Rando is pretty fucking beefy, starting off 14 levels above Buddy, and his attentions are pretty clear from the get-go. He's tired of the constant bloodshed, and he knows that Buddy is the only chance that this world will have at a future. So he's going to try his very best to keep her safe, all the while making sure she doesn't do anything batshit insane. He fails horribly, very quickly. Also, Pain Mode isn't in this game. Which is kind of a good thing, because to be entirely honest, there's not really a whole lot of reason for it to be in this. And I'm not going to apply that this game should have one, but I personally really loved it in Painful. To the point I think a lot of the complaints I had about it are actually a lot better if you start in Pain Mode. And is this a popular opinion? I'm going to go ahead and say outright, probably fucking no. But, at least for myself personally, I'd love to see a return even if I don't think I would ever advocate for it. Anyways, we get to our first real encounter against six fucking dudes. And I'll refrain from talking about my biggest complaint in this game for the time being, but if you've played this, I think you kind of know where I'm going already. Anyways, we get to this big hill, mountain, thing, and there's a list of names. That list of names is the people who run everything from top to bottom ranging from most important and most powerful, to least important and least powerful. Although to clarify, the bottom of the list isn't just like, Jeffrey from across the street. If your name is on this list whatsoever, you're pretty fucking important, but if you're at the top of the list, you're big. Not big, big with two E's. That's how fucking big you are. Afterwards, you rest in a nearby Rando outpost, and Rando is immediately informed that these three dudes right here had to knock out and tie Buddy to keep her safe, complaining about her violence and her outbursts. Rando is pretty justifiably pissed. He slowly crawls towards Buddy, and, uh... Yeah. Safe to say that analysis wasn't exactly wrong. 
A little bit later though, Buddy says something that sets the tone for the rest of the game. After she saw the list, she knows what she has to do. She has to kill everyone on that list. As she is the one woman left on Earth, she is very literally one of a kind, and in a weird sense, more important than anybody else on the planet. With this information in mind, she wants to rule a Leif. She wants her name at the top of that list, and she wants everybody to fear her. Rando very poorly tries to intervene by telling her about the scars on her body and the suffering that she's already went through. Buddy is already pretty fucking blunt as she immediately says that she doesn't feel anything, and that Rando is either with her or without her. And for the time being, he'll be with her. He's already extremely nice as he offers to watch over Buddy while she sleeps to ensure that she doesn't get hurt or injured, which is already a very nice callback to how generous he was in the last game, and also a nice way of dealing with the consequences of resting in the open world. At least for now, you don't really have to worry about choice encounters or random shit that happens when you go to rest. Buddy will always wake up fully healed without anything happening, but Rando won't. I believe you're almost always going to have to heal him with healing items, which is a really great way of balancing the resting both in a gameplay sense and in a story sense. Anyways, afterwards we'll get to the area's first crossroads, and just like the last game, I don't think I'm really going to get too in-depth with them. They're mostly very wacky, very goofy areas with weird archetypes of weird people acting in weird ways. And although you are very literally crossing a name off the list every time you go into a new crossroads area, I would struggle to call the areas themselves important, rather that they're more important as a whole, which... Don't get me wrong, I didn't expect to go into every zone expecting heartbreak and serious dramatic options and what have you, but... When you're putting this much emphasis on going through every crossroads for a very specific reason, I can't help but think it's strange that in terms of quality and options and what they provide, they're very similar to Lease of a Painfuls, in which the reasons you went through those zones are often... Who the fuck knows? And other than a very few standout encounters, I genuinely couldn't tell you a goddamn thing about any of these crossroads. Like, yes, I know I'm crossing off the names of the most powerful men in Olaith, but... How'd they become the most powerful men in Olaith? It's an incredibly basic question that goes around with the entire fucking concept of this game, and I'm gonna be honest, very few actually go in depth on why these zones exist and why they're considered the most powerful people. And the few that do are genuinely considered the best in the game. Am I asking for a civilization level breakdown like Vega Van Dam is most well known for his export of corn and his authoritarian government style and... No, obviously I'm not, but... When most of a game is revolving around the plot of becoming the most powerful person in Olaith, I can't help but think it's a missed opportunity that a lot of the most powerful people in Olaith are just like... Regular dudes that you'd find in anywhere else in the game. I can't help but think that the entire basis of this DLC was just undercooked. Anyways, I need to move on just so I can actually talk about the stuff that's happening in real time and not have another five minutes dedicated to gameplay systems that haven't even been discussed yet or brought up. Like I was saying, a lot of plot and exposition happens after resting in between every name being crossed off. The first rests are all pretty simple. Rando going buddy, what the fuck, and buddy going shut the fuck up Rando ad infinitum. But at some point the ending of pain mode is finally addressed to buddy that Rando is Dustin Armstrong, or Dusty, and they're pretty much brother and sister. Which makes a lot more sense why Dustin is trying to talk about Brad and why buddy is the way she is. I like this cutscene a lot. It brings up the ending in a way that makes sense to the characters, and it acts as a reveal to anybody who hasn't played Pain Mode. Although it is kind of obvious since your attack is also called Armstrong style, but that's besides the point. It's one of the many times that an epilogue or ending from Lease of a Painful is directly brought up, and as somebody who went through Pain Mode on their first try, I really enjoyed seeing this come up. Anyways, more crossroads happen, there's a town full of only pacifists, which haven't been disturbed by anyone exclusively just based on how much time and effort it took to build this up in a world as perilous as this one. And again, another thing a lot of people point out is that you don't have to fight any of the pacifists. 
but every time you walk by one, you have to make the conscious effort of whether or not you want to fight them. It's a very nice way of portraying the town and Buddy's thought process. Second guessing whether or not she wants to kill an entire town of innocent pacifists, or not killing an entire town full of innocent pacifists. It's a very black and white choice, to the point that it makes Fallout 3 look fucking subtle, but one that is very deliberate. Anyways, eventually enough names are crossed off that Dustin just leaves, and it really is Buddy all on her own. Afterwards, though, you can actually go down this cave and experience what I am very much hoping is the canon ending. Besides this, though, crossroads still happen, and I'm not exactly fond of going from one tangent straight into another, but we need to talk about the combat. It really, really just doesn't work with one or two party members. Lace of a Joyful is painfully easy. And this isn't strictly a negative, by the way, but it's the way that it becomes easier that I have a lot of problems with. Like, for example, the party members. In Lease of a Painful, every party member is expendable. They all have very obvious weaknesses and strengths and qualities and ways to use them. But in Lease of a Joyful, Buddy is just a badass and will pretty much hit Lease of a Painful's endgame and damage by like... Not even halfway through the list. And it's fucking insanity. And also on Joy. So in Painful there's endings if you do Joy and if you don't do any, yeah? This game doesn't have that. You can do every single pill you get, or none at all, and you will still get the same endings. Again, this isn't bad on paper, but you get joy a fuck ton. Way too often. I feel like I had 2 to 5 at my disposal for every encounter in the game. Which completely trivializes it with the amount of one-on-one -on -one boss battles. And even excluding the endings, using joy in painful felt more of a conscious choice. There are a lot of party members who start off with a Joy withdrawal that were usually super powerful and had great powers if you used Joy, but if you refrained, they were more often than not going to be a liability. Likewise, using Joy on a party member who's never done it can get them addicted, and that's not good for very similar reasons. In this game, it doesn't really matter. And again, since most boss battles are going to be one-on-one, -on -one, why wouldn't you just spam the uber-powerful super buff and completely trivialize it? And to directly tie that into what I'm going to say next, this game does not play well with the fact that you're only playing Buddy. There are a few encounters that came close, but most of the problems that would inherently come from swapping from four party members to one just don't show up. Item management and deciding when to heal should, on paper, be more important than ever because every time you use an item, that's a turn you're not inflicting status conditions, you're not hurting the enemy, you're not progressing the fight. There should be debates going on internally where you're deciding, should I use status conditions to buy some time, should I heal up and use some of my very limited supplies so I can stay safe, or should I go for all-out offense and hope I kill him quickly so I can maintain my supplies. None of that ever happens. Buddy has a lot of tools in her arsenal that all sound interesting, but usually you're going to be best off just spamming stabs unless you're fighting more than one enemy, in which you might go for a poison or a sleep bomb first, and then start stabbing shit. So it's not really as interesting or as engaging as his predecessor, which is again, okay. There's a lot of games on this list that have very lukewarm combat. But to tie this back into my last tangent, you're crossing names off of a list. The most powerful leaders of this country. Like, for example, Big Lincoln. In the list of the most powerful people, he is at the top. He is a warlord. He is described as a leviathan of a man. 
And then I get to him, I take two joy pills, I stab him, and I kick his fucking ass. And I will go ahead and say this might be the intention that the game was going for. But if it was, it wasn't translated well, or wasn't conveyed thoroughly. Again, it feels undercooked. And when you have a very underdeveloped story, that is very reliant on combat, and killing, that in of itself feels underdeveloped, it just makes me feel apathetic towards this entire part of the story. And again, I found myself oftentimes just disregarding every part of a story because after these points, you have a lot of very interesting setups and conversations and dialogue. And it feels like something was lost in translation or in development because every part of this just feels like an afterthought. Which is forgivable until that afterthought takes up a solid 70% of your game. And I hate to drag this out and I promise this is the last point I'm going to make, but I think it's really depressing that I'm just subconsciously telling myself, okay, you've ranted for however many minutes, let's go ahead and get to the parts that you love, and it's near the end of the game. You get the point. You find that Rando is being hanged to a pole with barbed wire over a large chasm, and he begs for forgiveness towards Buddy since he was complicit with her kidnapping. You either let him go and let him fall to his death, or hold on to the barbed wire. But eventually this guy shows up, and either way you're gonna have to let him go. Eventually you defeat him, you climb down the chasm, and he's either going to be dead, or he's barely clinging on to life, in which you can slit his throat as an act of revenge for complicity, or as a mercy killing. There's an ending that directly correlates with this choice, and honestly the thing I love the most about this game is its endings and its epilogues. There is a lot of variation and a lot of choices and endings. Like, for example, how much damage you did to Brad at the beginning of the game comes up in the ending. And for a real backhanded compliment, would I ever recommend replaying this game to see all the endings? No, nor would I recommend Lisa the Painful for that, although for different reasons. However, just go on the Lisa Wikipedia and look at all the endings. There really is a lot to admire. Also, back at it again with the backhanded compliments, but the one thing I actually think is really cool about crossing off names on the list... Every name you cross off, the route to your next victim gets more and more bloody and more and more disturbing. Which is genuinely a really great way of showing just how much bloodshed and terror you're causing to this world in your vindictive quest. Eventually you get to the very end, and there's this man who can evidently control the mutants. And you get to fight the one that was attempting to kill you at the very start of the game. This guy is Dr. Yado? Yado? And he's the basis of a lot of speculation and theories, as he's the one who created Joy to destroy all mankind and rebuild it in his own twisted image. He's also the one who conceived Buddy with his wife, who he killed after the birth, and tracked down Brad as a person to take care of the girl because of his past trauma. And despite this 4D game of chess he's playing and the batshit insanity of it all, everything he did did work, except for one massive stick. Buddy survived the war, and even killed his joy moons. And that was not supposed to happen by any metric. The thing is, unless you play this game a lot and go through all the endings, or have a guide on how to get all the endings, you're not really going to find out a whole lot about this guy in one playthrough. I'll be honest with you, Captain, I didn't. And I don't want to do this again, but genuinely, if you're expecting a really deep analysis on this character, I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But I digress. Eventually you kick the shit out of this mutant and you begin to fight Yaddo. And this fight is when the psychedelic and weird dark shit starts to go into overdrive. Buddy starts suffering from hallucinations very early on, and... What the fuck's going on? I, I don't know. You start to kill off Rando instead of Yaddo eventually, and after doing so, you see a vision of Brad in a really fucking depressing scene that I hate. I s it sucks. I despise this. I love it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
After this gut punch, you confront him at a cliff before Buzzo kills him off. Then there's one more battle you have to go through as Buzzo starts to very rapidly transform into this... thing. And I don't like it. Once you kill it off, you get the last choice of the game that chooses your main ending. You begin to hallucinate more and more and more, with Rando peering at the other side of the cliff, telling Buddy exactly what she wants to hear. That she's a god, a queen, and yada yada yada. And right behind you, your dad starts to appear. And you either get to stay with your hallucinations, which gives you the join them endings, or you take the vaccine that you get off of Yaddo and get the leave them ending. Myself personally, I went with the join them ending at first, and... It's, uh, it's not a particularly great sign to see. With this transformation, you completely doom humanity. The Leave Them ending simply has you with Yado's trumpet alongside Brad and the same baby. Although it's a bit less fucked than the last ending, the baby's father is, despite many attempts on guessing who it is, entirely unknown. Another thing to note is that Rando has a dedicated grave to his memory instead of being there alongside Buddy. Really, I'd like to imagine that this is the quote, good ending, but only just because the join them ending is so disturbing and fucking awful. There's also all the epilogues, which I can't go in depth with, but again, they're all great. They have very wildly different ways on how to obtain them, and generally, I would highly recommend reading up on them at the very least. And I will say one thing about the endings that I didn't really realize until I was about to get to the summary, is that a lot of this ending, in a sense, feels very disconnected from the main game. Specifically with Buzzo and Yado. Like, don't get me wrong, I like how they actually explained a lot of the stuff that was brought up in Painful, but... Not a whole lot of it really applies with your adventure in Joyful, barring a few choice dialogues or encounters. But I don't want to repeat myself again, so instead, let's get to the summary so I can repeat myself again. As a package deal with Lisa the Painful, I really like Lisa the Joyful. It explores a lot of themes and questions and weird hypotheticals that the last game brought up, but didn't really answer or explain in as much depth as you would hope. But when you really start to analyze Lisa the Joyful on its own, I can't help but feel that it's a tad bit disappointing. And I don't mean like comparing it on its own as if you didn't play Lisa the Painful, I mean comparing it on its own merits. The individual storylines and plots in this just didn't get me to care, and I felt like for the most part I was playing this game just to get to the next part of the story. And this could be the developer's intentions, I say this over and over and over again. Because if the intention was to make you feel as null and heartless and as mindlessly violent and edgy as Buddy is, they fucking succeeded. But when I look at the Kickstarter and it's the last girl stretch goal, what happened? Who am I? Why am I the only girl? Explore these questions and more with this additional gameplay content starring Buddy. And the Steam page has features such as collect new masks, Buddy can dash, which is an objective fact I suppose, flash your enemies, I guess, all new enemies and areas and new timed attacks? I just don't think that's the intention. And the thing is, all the best things about this game, you can just entirely miss. Like, there are so, so many great things about this game that I feel like 90% of the players are just never going to experience because it's out of the way, or you have to do some random shit to get it. And that's inherently my entire problem with this. I feel like 80% of the game, I just am not allowed to think. And then I get to the 20% and I'm engrossed, I'm loving all the things in it. All the possibilities and themes that are explored, it does a lot of things fantastically. But for everything it does fantastically, I have to slog through 20, 30, maybe even 40 minutes of... this. And in all truthfulness, I know there's going to be comments left below saying, Oh, why did you use Joy? You trivialized this game for yourself. And on my very first playthrough, I very well might have. However, even if you start to impose arbitrary restrictions on yourself, such as no joy, not using specific abilities, so on and so forth, this game doesn't provide enough for that to be interesting. I honestly find it comparable to Mass Effect 1 where I'm having a fantastic time just digesting the world, exploring, finding out more about everything, and then it's like Shepard, get in the fucking car, and I don't want to play the goddamn game anymore. 
But while Mass Effect will take you 15 hours at least, and it's the first part of a series that is well loved, this is the final part of a series that is going to take you 4 hours at most. However, I still think in a lot of ways this is worth a buy. I would pay $5 exclusively for that one scene where I had to fight Brad and it just tore my fucking heart out. But I can't help but feel that it fell short in a lot of ways. Let's talk about something completely different. Hylix. I think there comes a time in every game I've covered where you kind of get the point of what to expect. Off is a wacky, quirky RPG with moments of genuine respite and reflection. It proposes a world that is very strange, one where a lot of things happen that definitely shouldn't, but by the end everything makes sense in its own obscure way. Least of the painful and joyful are games that share that similar thematic, games where you get to play through a strange world with stranger characters, yet the characters make sense in that world, and although there is a ton of lighthearted idiocy, it's often interjected with genuinely solemn, hateful, or otherwise remorseful moments that get you to think about the overall world and its inhabitants a little bit deeper. My analysis for Hylix? I think both of these games have a target audience, and I've pinpointed the target audience for this one. So I have to ask you, rhetorically mind you, please for the love of god don't shout this out loud or whatever. Do you like drugs? No, I'm fucking serious, let me be honest, there is no analysis to be done here. You play as a moon man named Wayne, and you have to fight Gibby, and I honestly love these character designs. But in terms of plot, what the fuck are you getting? A bunch of randomized nonsense that is only slightly interjected with something that someone with at least 17 brain cells could coherently come up with. Nothing makes sense. Trying to do an analysis of Hylix is like trying to do an in-depth analysis of a fucking four-year-old's painting that's on the fridge. But goddammit, look at the animation that plays when you use a burrito. Or what about dynamite, even? Everything is drawn in this weird claymation style that is pixel art, and it's weird, it's a very foreign combination I don't think I could have ever come up with in a million years. And the music is... At the worst of times, Hylix sounds like it's having a goddamn seizure. But not necessarily in the blow your ears out way, more so just incredibly strange. A lot of the other times it's just really weird, I don't really know how to describe it, but the rest of it is really great, calming, relaxing, and just generally laid back, which is really weird when it's contrasted with <laughs> Look at the fucking cat. Is the RPG combat good? No. The only viable strategy on beating the final boss is throwing enough dynamite at it to make North Korea think you're being a bit excessive. But this game's combat could literally just be one button that's just... fight. And it would still be worth going through just because of how much weird and wacko shit you'll be seeing on your adventure. But goddammit, when Wayne fucking dies, he does this funny little animation where he just melts and he goes to the afterlife which has... a couch? and meat, and talking fish. Look at the animation that plays when I use vegetables. If you're any person who does recreational drugs, I don't care what it is, play this game while you're high and everything will make sense, and you will probably overanalyze a randomized quote of some fucking dog for 50 minutes before snapping back into reality and laughing at the animation that plays when you use the meat book spell. Could I give you my own analysis of this experience firsthand? No. The hardest recreational drug I've ever taken is allergy medicine. Because goddammit, trees kick my ass. However, there is no way in fuck this isn't the best drug game imaginable. Do I endorse drugs? I would give you a rhetorical answer, but that's not what I'm here for, as I don't live your life. All I know is that if you do, this game is as the high school drug dealer who keeps fucking contacting me for some reason to drink lean and do weed and also keeps threatening to suck my cock would say, really fucking lit bro. Look at the run animation. Like no seriously, I could watch this shit for hours. 
Could I do a thorough plot analysis of the stuff that is available? Yes. Am I? No. I would highly recommend it if you have absolutely nothing better to do in your life. And despite how mean everything I'm saying is in connotation, I want to say that I mean all this in the best way. Like, I understand with my vocal range of monotone and slightly less monotone that everything I'm saying is probably harsh. But dude, this is fucking awesome. This game is literally in an art gallery. That's how bizarre and wonderful it is. However, I'm not going to cover it in depth, but if you want a game that is more refined, play Hylix 2. Granted, you have to buy it, and I'm not covering it because it's not an RPG Maker game, but Hylix 2 is by most standards entirely better. The combat is better, the story makes a little bit more sense as if that's an insurmountable bar to pass, and if you thought this game's graphics were out there, holy shit, you haven't seen anything. What's going on? Play the game and find out because I'm sure as fuck not going to be able to tell you. I will give it the Objectively A Video Game Ever Award, 11 out of 10. Now the first Hylix, I don't know, I think that's striving for a perfect negative 7. But... I, I don't... What am I supposed to say? It's fucking Hylix. Uh, play it if you want, I don't know. Let's go ahead and talk about One Shot. I know my bias is going to immediately show when I say this, but if you have not played One Shot, I would heavily advise not watching this. Have I given this warning to any other game I've talked about thus far? Outside of the intro? No. Do all of them benefit from going in blind? Immensely so. Maybe with the exception of Hylix. So why am I bringing it up here? I guess from a logistical point of view, it's the fact that this is a very point A to point B game with very little variation from how you play that. And it's a puzzle game, which means the second you know the solutions, you're just going to kind of ruin the appeal of it in the first place. But in all honesty, it's neither of those. It's that this game hits different, is what I suppose I should be saying since I'm a dumb 20 year old zoomer. I left this game with a feeling very little games ever have, but in the sentimental and boohoo emotions way. I am not just a guy, but I am also a content creator, which basically makes it illegal to talk about my feelings. But one of my biggest faults when it comes to video games and pretty much all fiction and media is that I literally cannot get emotionally invested in stories. Do you know that fucking meme format? I can't believe he didn't cry during blank. Do men even have feelings? That's me, except the second panel actually has nothing. They were onto something there. It takes, like, genuinely the most heart-wrenching bullshit in the world for me to get any fucking feelings beyond, oh, sad. So if there's any game on this list that I would recommend skipping and experiencing for yourself, it's this one. Why? Well, I mean, I'm going to get into that in just a minute, but I'm just going to say it outright. I love this game. So, assuming you got past that, let's go ahead and play the game. You wake up as Nico, and first things first, quick pause, this is not important, but I need to mention it so I can avoid angry commenters. Nico's gender is left ambiguous, as it's intended for you to kind of fill in the gap subconsciously. But it's not non-binary, it's just left intentionally unknown. I refer to him as a little dude because I guess when I played the game, his antics reminded me of a little dude. So I'm going to refer to him as a he. You're not wrong if you refer to Nico as a she or a they, just as I'm not right for calling him a he. Do not lecture me on this, please and thank you. Anyways, we wake up as Nico in a very, very dark house. The first puzzle of the game is finding out the password to this computer, and once you do so... I'm just gonna let this play out. Yep, it's going to be one of those games. So I'll cover this a little bit more in depth later, but just keep this in mind. You do some more puzzles, go downstairs, find a light bulb, put it in this thing here, and you get transported away. 
Doing a little bit of exploring in this land, you find this robot right here, and he's a very effective yet immediate exposition dump. Now one thing I'm going to say immediately is that this game does dialogue exceptionally well. Look, let me be honest with you, I am an ADHD bastard. So when a game makes me, of all people, go out of my way and explore for minutes at a time just to see if the game changes dialogue if I did something, which it more than likely does, that is some of the highest praise I can ever give. So even when I'm saying something that should have a negative connotation to it, like, quote, an exposition dump, keep in mind that doesn't mean it's bad. So for example, the reason that he's here and he's the way that he is, is that he's programmed to be just that. Nico is this world's savior and messiah, and after recognizing this, he's programmed to give you a bunch of information and to answer any questions that you have. And to do this, he breaks the fourth wall fucking immediately because I'm God. And that is always a terrible sign. Also, quick and mandatory pause for Davy Gunface lore, as much as I hate to say it, my real name isn't Davy Gunface. My first name is David. So while growing up, my dad was generally called Dave, while my grandfather was generally called David. And David Jr. is a cringe-ass fucking name, so eventually it became Davy. Which has sort of became my real name in a sense, in the way that most people refer to me as Davy. That's why David is being brought up, and why David is what's being used. Anyways, to directly tie that into the next point, you talk to Nico. Or rather, Nico starts to talk to you. And if for any reason your real name isn't the name being used, like for example if your computer name was somebody else's, or really any of the dozens of reasons that your real name might not be the one that's being used, there's a dialogue prompt here to change just that. And although this is entirely missable, in my opinion, it was the best way to go about this because, say for example, I could just change my name midway through with a setting in the menu, it would severely dampen the impact of a lot of moments if Nico just started randomly calling me Davy Gunface instead of David for no plausible reason. I'm getting way, uh, way ahead of myself here though, so for this one in particular, I let it roll with David because it kind of works with what I just told you. Now here's the cool thing about Nico. You can talk to him, and he can talk to you. And although you control him, you don't directly host him, if that makes sense. Like, sure, you can tell him where to go and what to interact with, but he's not always going to do what you suggest to do. He's not going to destroy the light bulb, he's not going to sink to the bottom of the ocean and die, he's just... He's just Nico. You'll get to really connect with this little guy over the course of the story, and again, this game's dialogue just completely kills it. And even after my years and years of being online and watching countless hours of YouTube and Twitch, this is the closest thing to a parasocial relationship I've ever experienced. Anyways, for the other questions, the rest of them connect together. This world is ruined, it's deteriorating rapidly, and it's holding on by just a thread. Overall, the world has a very melancholy feel to it, and to restore it, you have to replace the world's sun. This is also left ambiguous for now, but the last thing to note is that this game has three regions. Right now we're in the Fringe, a barren wasteland with no inhabitants. And I'll get to the other two once we get to them. For now at least, that's the lore and the premise of the game, and I guess myself. Go exploring. I'll generally keep most of the puzzles brief, as there are ones that are pretty standard, like going to a nearby factory to turn a metal bar into a crowbar to open a box, and there's some that are shit like this. You have to find it so Nico can progress. But it's not part of this world, so it's impossible for Nico to find it. But you can. So where is it? The fucking documents folder. It took me a second to find it because I have like, a billion scripts in there, but yeah, sure enough it's there, we get the code, put it into here, and get our gas masks. Key thing to note though, these puzzles are randomized. Although 826430 might have worked for me, that won't work for you unless you get insanely lucky with generation. There are exceptions throughout the game, but for the most part you're going to have to find out the solution for yourself. Also we forgot to mention it due to video scripting and pacing, but this here is Silver. She's cool. She's the first character to call us the Messiah just by looking at us in our light bulb, and you get some more lore on this area. You talk to her a bit later, and she gives you this piece of amber with a clover on it to get this dumb robot to navigate us to the next area. 
foreshadowing. You also play a chess match against her in which Nico really sucks. And I relate to that as someone who has no clue what the fuck a Sicilian defense hyperaccelerated dragon is. You explore a little bit more about a relatively unknown process called taming. Although taming and the concept of being tamed is strange and complicated, for the most part when a robot is acting like a stereotypical or standard robot, that means it's untamed. And although there isn't a whole lot of tamed robots in this world, Silver is one of them. It's why, at least comparatively, it seems like she has a free will and can act on her own. It doesn't follow a set list of inputs or actions, it's just Silver. But this is something we'll get into way, way, way later, so I'm not going to go in depth. Before going off to that boat, though, Nico politely asks if he can go to sleep. And if you're somehow a big enough dick to say no and try to progress without sleeping, you can't. So we get to bed and the game closes. Now I want to do a very minor side tangent here. This is obviously, if you've ever played this game, the Steam version. However, a very similar yet significantly less refined and smaller version of this game was released before this. It has the same, or at least a similar plot and... Well, remember in the beginning where it says you have one shot? That used to be very literal on the old version because do you know what happens when you quit the game? Nico fucking dies! You killed him, he's dead! The title is completely corrupted, the entire world is dark, the light bulb is shattered, and Nico is gone, and the song My Burden Is Light changes to a corrupted version called My Burden Is Dead. I hate that on like a trillion levels. Fuck you. Now obviously, this is kind of a spoiler, but Nico cannot and does not die in this game. So when I went back and read this, I kind of lost my shit. But in this version at least, if you quit the game, Nico just kind of comments that he felt the entire world go dark and freeze, just like how a program would if you shut it off. Like sure, it retains the data when you're last on, but in terms of actually having anything progress on its own without being open? Nah. I'd imagine this is in place so if your game crashes in one way or another you can actually play the game. And also, the amount of rage people would have if they couldn't play the game they spent 15 bucks on would probably be immensely high. Now the one thing to note is you don't get the one-shot ending if you do this, so keep it in mind and don't do that. Now did any of this fucking apply to going to sleep? No. It's absolutely mandatory, it has absolutely no effect on Nico, and Nico just goes to sleep. But I wanted to mention it because holy fuck why. Anyways, after you open the game, when it closes, you get your first dream sequence with Nico in his home. You of course see it, and Nico is kind enough to inform us about all the cool stuff in his world. You also tell him that you're not from this world either, and he's generally really excited by almost any answer you give him, and it's the cutest shit ever. There's a lot of these segments throughout the game, and they're all equally cute and I love them. They're really nice, I don't know what else to say. Anyways, you talk to the robot again after you sleep, and you head to the next area. And if you're curious as to why I didn't go into much depth about the fringe, it's mostly because all the inhabitants are... robots. So other than Silver, there wasn't a whole lot of character diving or exploration to do. The next area is the Glen, and its inhabitants are a lot more interesting. At the very least, from a scripting perspective. There's a lot of birds, and I had a point in the script here where I said I don't know what their exact race name is, but it's just bird people. I mean, it's not wrong, I guess. Anyways, here's Calamus, and the first real puzzle of the zone is finding his little sister, Alula, who ran off. He's also the first of very many characters who apologizes for talking to you because you're the messiah, you're this mystical entity who is going to save the world, and Nico is just like, not really there for it. After agreeing to help him, we find this robot who tells us we need to sign this sheet of paper to proceed into the next zone. We go to the nearby ruins, find another computer puzzle, and this one I found within seconds because I have a dual monitor set up, and goddammit, Alrak High Lord of the Taldream has transformed into blocks. Obviously, these blocks are a solution to a tile puzzle we'll get to in just a second. But first, we need to talk to Maze. Anyway, she's fucking dying. And this entire scene that plays out is bittersweet. 
we're going to give her the sun. And despite how dangerous and risky that sounds, this is a last gift and gesture of kindness towards someone who is very important to this land and is fully aware she is going to die soon. Like I said, it's just extremely bittersweet. But after doing so, we can get to this puzzle, put in the tiles and rescue Alula. Doing this, our wallpaper returns to normal, and despite the fact I suspected bullshittery was bound to be afoot, this was actually when the bullshittery ended, so there was none to be found. Kalmus reunites with Alula, it's very sweet, and we get to go to her house. There's a very self-aware arbitrary video game puzzle joke, and goddammit this game is still really cute. There's only so many times I can say I love this dialogue, and these characters are cute before it gets obnoxious, but it really is, okay? Anyways, we get a feather from them, which we need to progress the story. And I know I haven't really talked about them, and I mentioned it earlier, but I won't discuss this game's more standard puzzles unless it's absolutely required for context. Because don't get me wrong, they're good. But when this game has shit like this going on, and this... I mean, at least for a video like this, just making a pin isn't as interesting. And I don't think you really need me to give you a step-by-step -step walkthrough on everything going on. Anyways, we also do some trading with this guy, and every item you try to trade with him gets a unique response from Nico. And I backtracked to this guy every time I got a new item, exclusively because I wanted to see what happened. Unfortunately, you cannot sell the sun. But you can do some trading and get some fabric dye so we can make that pin I mentioned earlier. You also get an achievement for doing what I just said, and for some reason, it's the rarest achievement in the entire game. Unfortunately, I didn't get it because I didn't know I needed to get the t-shirt, and I didn't even know there was a t-shirt to begin with, so... Shit. Anyways, like I mentioned, we can make a pin now and we can get past this guard. Of course, before doing so, we have to pick up the sun again, and... One, Maze is gone, and all that remains is a seed that she left behind, and more importantly, two, the sun is fucking gone! God damn it, don't do this- oh, okay, it's- it's okay. It's okay. It is okay. Okay. Okay? Okay. Anyways, I try to sell the sun immediately afterwards, and Nico has an existential crisis whether or not selling a plant is like selling her baby, and I have to say, the little portraits in this game are all incredible. They add a lot of character to this game's already immensely charming characters and dialogue, and fuck it, I'm just gonna put a counter in the top right. Alright? We'll see what we get to by the end. Of course, before progressing, we have to let Nico do a big sleep, and we have another little dream sequence. He asks me if I've ever seen a wheat field before, and as someone who lives literally 200 feet away from one, I have to say yes. There's also a lot more questions that don't revolve around wheat, but fuck it, I'm not letting you know. Nico can, I trust him with all of my being, but you? No, go away. Anyways, we get past the guard and this shit starts to happen, which, as someone who has played at least one Bethesda game in their life, is probably a feature. However, unlike Todd Howard's Dragon Adventure, this is... actually a feature, so ignore everything I just said because it was entirely redundant. Anyways, going through this cave, we're at the next zone of this game, The Refuge. The Refuge is a gorgeous, bright, neon city, and another thing I love about this game is just how unique all the zones are comparatively. They all have their own unique inhabitants, environments, and stories, and it feels like every time you progress to a new zone, an entirely brand new chapter opens up, and it makes the pacing feel really nice. But here's a guy who's just not having a good time, so we're going to go ahead and check up on him. This guy is referenced by a few names, and I believe the developers wanted to call him Sebastian at one point, but Maintenance Guy and Mr. Lamplighter are just way too good, so I'm gonna go with those two. He's the comic relief, a 20-something year old guy who overworks himself a tad bit too often. Way too often, but other than his work-related stress, he's a pretty mellow dude. I like him a lot. And honestly, in a really weird sense, a lot of his dialogue reminds me of myself. And I don't really know what that says about myself, but I'd be lying if I said it didn't imply anything. So we gotta find a way to get this elevator right here working, and to do this, we have to make a button that works... somehow? So let's go get some parts. There's also this lady right here who comments on a lamplighter and just how extreme he is about his job. 
oftentimes just coming in, getting coffee, and leaving. And she tells us that if we want anything cooked, we can come talk to her. Foreshadowing. Also, here's another computer puzzle. This one in particular took me by far the longest to figure out. You gotta take this weird film and expose it to the void. The void is beyond the four walls that bind this world to ours. And it's the edges of our view where everything is obscured. Which means we gotta do... this. This took me way longer than I would care to admit, but eventually we got our code of 63014. We do some more exploring, pick up a bunch of items to make a button, question mark, that we can try to put in the elevator and it does somehow work. But you need a security code. That, of course, in this example is 63014, and the lamplighter is like, dude, what the hell, and it's all just messiah mumbo-jumbo. Before we go up, though, we gotta take a big nap. Here's Nico's mom, and more annoyingly, my cursor and press Alt-Z to use G-Force experience, go the fuck away. Nico's mom cooks him some pancakes, and Nico fucking loves pancakes. That's his favorite food, and he just goes on and on and on about pancakes and birthdays and food and neighbors, and it's just... My favorite food is Crab Rangoon. Afterwards, we can go back to the elevator, and apparently the guy was just holding the door open the entire time waiting for Nico. Afterwards, an elevator ride definitely does happen. I especially love this line in particular. You can also talk to him about his job, the city, and other various topics, but it's not required. Once you get up the elevator, you can explore some more. This happens. This isn't explained until way, way later, and although we do find the culprit, they're intentionally cryptic and vague about what they have to say. And we do some more puzzling. This area has one objective. The tower. And although I found it extremely early on, and knew the solution, it wasn't time to do this just yet, so nothing happened. Also, thank god Nico doesn't fucking die in this version, because in a hypothetical I was playing the free version, he would be goddamn dead. Anyways, there is a lot in this part of the refuge, and there's enough that it's mostly unique from the part before the elevator. We meet up with this lady, and you wouldn't be wrong if you thought that she looked familiar. You can talk to her about just that, but first you have to get her library card so you can forge an entirely new one to get into the library. I didn't mention that, but you need to get into the library. The reason we can't right now is that the queue time to get a card right now is exceptionally long, and we obviously can't just sit around and wait. Anyways, this person's name is Kip, and she's this world's leading researcher. If you talk to her with the Amber, she talks about that taming process I mentioned way earlier. And although it's not time to get into it fully, it just kind of explores what I mentioned in passing. About how Silver was a robot that was designed to have a free will, or at least something similar. But that only led to it going rogue. There were just way too many contradictions in the coding. And really, at least for right now, the only new piece of information we have is that Silver is based on her. But again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but we'll get into this later. For now, we have to make a fake library card which entails sticking this card with glue, taking a picture with the lenses we got way earlier, and slapping that picture of Nico on the card. Doing this, we can talk to the person right here and get what we needed from the library. Our main goal in getting here was to translate this book and see what it had in store for us. This person is George, and they say that it'll take a fair amount of time, so during this, we can just go ahead and sleep in the guest room right down the hall. We have another dream sequence where Nico is done eating his pancakes, then the dream quickly turns into a nightmare as the light bulb shatters inconspicuously. This is the first dream where Nico doesn't talk to us about what happens, which is a very somber sign. With the journal translated, we can finally read it. And we find out that this wasn't meant for Nico, it was meant for David. Whoever that loser may be. And this journal tells us about the tower. The tower is near that one puzzle I mentioned way earlier, and it has some more fourth wall breaking shenanigans. There will be an entity who will guide us through it, which has no physical form, but it can communicate through machinery. So we gotta bring it to the tower and have it guide Nico and I on what to do. We also get a solution to the puzzle. Look at the pattern on the floor and do as it says. The window will be gone, so you need to bring it back. So, 
yeah, I was on the right track, I just did it way too early. So we gotta do that again, but first, Nico is really hungry, which is fair enough. You know what that means? It's pancake time, dude. Pancakes are pretty good. Although midway through eating them, he gets extremely upset. Thinking about his mom, talking about whether or not he'll see her again, whether he can even save this world, and he doesn't know why he's even here, or why he's the one to carry this burden. It's all very sudden, yet entirely rational. It's really fucking sad and it pushes you even further to help Nico complete his journey. And of course we're going to do just that. We go back to the tower and this time, unlike the last, there's no exit prompt, so... We're on to something. We open up one shot again, have another dream sequence, everything fades to black, and then Nico wakes up. He no longer has the sun with him anymore, and he calls out to us asking if we knew where it went. And for once in the game, we actually can't answer him. He calls out again, and again, and again, and again, and we still can't reply. You can then let him walk around this area a bit until he eventually finds a computer that talks to us again. And by us, I mean Nico. This lying bitch-ass computer is telling Nico about how I completed my task, and how I'm gone, and how he completed his, and it's time for him to rest, and I'm just not having it. Nico himself is also really unsure because he never got to say goodbye to me and he doesn't really feel like this is the end of the journey. And he's right, I open up one shot again and instantly as soon as I click it, Alarak digivolves into a piece of paper telling us to go document slash my game slash one shot and look for this symbol. I find it, activate it, relaunch the game, and we get another dream sequence. Nico wakes up and the game is just exceptionally not happy with me existing. And then the clover turns into a completely different transparent window that you have to place all over the game's window to match with the clover on the bottom right. All the while the note itself actually updates us in between every room, telling me more about the world and everything that's going on. It was extremely bizarre, yet it was something I really enjoyed. Because is this an exceptionally hard brain teaser puzzle that you have to like, sit back and think about? No. But in terms of gameplay, you are entirely relying on this thing to solve the puzzles. And if you're relying on this thing to solve the puzzles, you're more than likely going to be focused on it and what it's saying. And why wouldn't you trust what it's saying when it's helping you get through puzzles that you would have absolutely no chance of solving on your own? Especially when it's seemingly helping you against this asshole right here. It's genuinely a really great way to accomplish three very different goals simultaneously and it's one of my favorite parts of this game exclusively because of that. In terms of what was actually revealed, we'll get to that in just a second. But we can talk to Nico again, and he's very excited to see us, and I'm very excited to see him. Press Alt-Z to open G-Force Experience. There's a bit more dialogue, we find the sun again, and we're transported here. The entity then tells us that we won. He concedes to us, and then he tells us that to beat the game we have to shatter the light bulb. But that's... obviously wrong, right? Well, no. One of the things that the notes revealed to us is that this isn't going to just be as simple as letting Nico place the light bulb and letting him return home. It's going to be a choice. Either you place down the light bulb and save this world at the cost of Nico no longer being able to return home, or you do the opposite, you shatter the light bulb, completely doom this world, and Nico gets to return home. Both of these choices are fucking brutal to make and I hate them both. Myself personally, I let Nico return home as... This is a really dumb reason, but at least from my perspective, once he returns home, this world will be naught but memory. It's going to be stuck on my hard drive forevermore, and although its inhabitants will die off, Nico will be home safe, and I can just remain blissfully unaware of the repercussions that this has. And is this a good reason to do this? No, I'll be honest, it's flawed at best. But to be honest, I think both of these choices inherently are. This is a completely loaded question that ultimately every player is going to have a completely different thought process on, and it's one of the most brutal ones I've ever seen in any video game. Both options are viable, but both options suck. And again, I promise I'm not saying this for the algorithm or whatever, but I would love to hear what choice you made and why you made it. I just personally think it's really interesting to hear just because both choices are so somber and bittersweet. 
But anyways, afterwards I let Nico return home as he walks through the Taldrin battlefield off of my computer, and we get a final cutscene where the entire window fades to nothingness. At the very least if you chose this ending, and it's awful. And now every time you try to launch the game, you get this fatal error and it immediately crashes. But. However. We haven't talked about something yet. The Solstice Route. This is a route that is exclusively locked behind the Steam version of OneShot, and you need to complete this game at least once to do it. This was unlocked as a bonus chapter a bit after the Steam version's launch, and it was hinted about for a long time. Mainly through this clock that, if you go through the game right now, is just going to be stuck at 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 repeating. However, when this game came out, it was constantly ticking down until this date. And then once that date happened, an update came out for the game. And even the way you unlocked this was evidenced beforehand, with the bold letters in the About This page on Steam being slash S-O-L-S-T-I-C-E. I don't, I don't need to spell that out for you. Now, for somebody like me who was initially concerned that this would be like an Undertale scenario where very little changes between the initial game and the activation of the next route, you would be sorely mistaken. Now, in a hypothetical where you actually did have to go through the entire game again, you already know the solution to all the puzzles, you can just speedrun the game. So again, in contrast to a game like Undertale where you have to go through all the bosses, all the random encounters, all the mandatory stuff to get to the route, making sure you do it right, and yada 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 that takes hours and hours and hours. If you remember everything, this might take you 50 minutes at most. But again, this is a hypothetical because you actually unlock it extremely easily in the first zone of the game with a simple prompt. But we'll get there when we get there. First things first, open up the Clover application, delete your save file, then relaunch the game. Then you have to activate the Solstice route. Once you do so, you can meet up with Silver, go to this cave, and this is where the route truly begins. If you go to your inventory and activate your journal in this specific spot, you can spawn a minecart to go down this previously inaccessible cave. Once you do so, you are now locked to the Solstice route and you don't have to worry about potentially doing something wrong and being kicked out of the route. Unless you do some really stupid file bullshittery. But for the most part, once you're on it, you're on it. Once you do this, the game gets really, really meta. Like I was trying to come up with a clever metaphor on how much more meta it got and incorporate Meta Knight into the metaphor, but I really got nothing, so here's a picture of a walnut tree. So look, you're gonna have to stick with me. We went through 30 minutes of the first route alone, and this route is just batshit insanity, so strap in because we're going down a rabbit hole. Even while scripting, I was having to mentally prepare myself. I haven't even fucking finished the script. It's not done. All of it is, except for one segment that I am not going to do and I'm procrastinating on because I don't know how the fuck I'm going to explain it. So anyways, you meet up with this guy right here. This is Prototype, and he's an entirely brand new character. Do you remember that guy at the very beginning of the game? He's kind of like him, however Prototype is tamed, so this is like an extremely primitive version of him. Plus he gives more elusive and more in-depth information, so he's a lot more important, with having free will and all that. First things first though, we have to do a puzzle to get him a backup memory disc. And upon doing so, he tells us more about himself and asks if Nico remembers this game's ending. And tells him that if he's here, this isn't his first time through this world. You've seen a few hints of Nico kind of realizing this already, such as when he called out my name as soon as he woke up and asking me if we met before. But this is where the existential crises and questions of being a video game character get shoved into overdrive. There's a lot more dialogue that just boils down to an in-universe reasoning for why OneShot exists as a game that I can download, and how I can interact with characters, and Nico is just not really understanding it. And, I mean, it's really easy to see why. He's asking me questions like, why would I create a doomed world? And why would I put him through this if I was a kind god? Which is obviously not the case, as I didn't make this game, but... It's understandable why there's confusion, there's a lot to process at once. 
Eventually though, the Entity gets really pissed off at us, tells us that Nico is upset, and that I upset him, and that pixelation that happened from time to time in the last playthrough starts to happen immediately and very, very rapidly. And characters start to fucking die. Silver, for example, sacrifices herself to save Nico, and... At this point, Nico is just really, really confused and he's starting to have more and more and more of an existential crisis as he tries to digest everything he learned and is trying his best to understand it to the best of his ability. But once you move on to the Glen, it is just completely different. Once you're on this route, you're on it. It railroads you down where you need to go, and everything past the Glen is a very A to B experience with some puzzles, sure, but you don't really explore. Maze is still down here and she's still dying, sure, but in this version she's dying because she's pushing herself to her very limit to try and ensure that the Glen's residents survive another day. Even though this is entirely hopeless and herself and everybody else is going to die very soon anyways, she still persists. It's a very nihilistic situation, but despite it, she's still optimistic. And just like last playthrough, you can offer her the sun, however, this time she rejects it. The complete and utter hopelessness of what she's doing and how much she's pushing herself despite that hopelessness is why she's doing what she's doing. And that even the slightest amount of respite or comfort is ultimately going to make her falter. It's extremely dark and morbid, but just like a lot of scenarios in this game and a lot of set pieces, it's bittersweet, and I really enjoy seeing it. You also meet up with these two again, as they're locked out of their house, you get on a boat and you go down this body of water that was previously inaccessible. And then you get to talk to this guy right here. His name is Cedric and he's a nerd. More importantly though, this ram is back and goddammit he's just as delightful as ever. <laughs> After you talk to Cedric, your main goal is to get this flying machine up and running so you can proceed to the refuge. You gotta get a few parts to do so, and the way you get all those parts are delightfully bittersweet. And I'm going to be saying that word a lot. For example, Maze gives her life so she can make a few more bridges so he can get to this part of the land. You get a music box for free from the merchant since he's trying to help you save the world. And all these robots agree to power themselves off to give you this power cell so you can activate the flying machine. Once you get both of these parts, you can finally give them to Cedric and he can finish the flying machine. But while he's doing so, Nico inquires a bit more about this world and... Well, more and more and more existential nonsense. Cedric kind of just admits that's a really, really complicated subject, and for the time being we shouldn't worry about how real the world is and how real every individual is, and rather focus on the plan that we're going down. And really outside of context, I think this is kind of my approach to philosophy as a whole. I have absolutely no clue what the grand meaning of life is, or if there even is one, but goddammit dude, last week I went to a zoo and... There were just a ton of otters. Like, don't get me wrong, there were animals I loved more there, like tortoises and... Tortoises, but goddammit, otters. They have those cute little hands and their cute little feet and their tails and they swim, they swim, they swim, they swim, and goddammit, that's all the meaning I need. Anyways, let's get back off topic. We learn that the World Machine is kind of the canon name for this game and or application. So, I'll be saying the World Machine a lot now. The World Machine and these characters in particular aren't originally from this world, and they created this one as a last ditch effort, to take all the remnants of the old world from a pool of memories and create this one. And that was then turned into code, and to run that code, something else needed to run the World Machine. That something else being our computer. I had to install this game and run it on my hardware to get this game up and running. And also the living person that this world needed to be saved isn't me. That would actually be Nico. It's a lot to digest and really we don't get enough time to even do so. Calamus and Alula run over and we tell them that we're going to pick them up and take them to the city after we go to the city. You know, because there's not really a whole lot of space, this isn't exactly an economy flight. 
A cutscene plays out, and before we could actually go back and rescue them, the plane gets destroyed and that means those two are stuck on that island, doomed to inevitably be consumed by the void of squares that were already crawling towards the island at a concerning speed. So, uh, yeah. Gotta hurry, dude. This time in the refuge, the maintenance guy fucking dies. Well, he doesn't outright die, but he's trapped just like Calamus and Alua. Although he's stuck in an elevator, which is a whole lot worse than being stuck on an island. Gotta hurry, dude. Also, in the next part of the refuge, Cedric just runs straight to the lab to get a required part and fucking dies. And at this point, things do not look exceptionally swell. Nico directly talks to us and needlessly apologizes for being rude to us. And I'm going to go ahead and put air quotes over rude because it was a pretty rational reaction. And then he thanks us for being with him. He tells us that he's not afraid anymore, that he knows why he's in this world, that he's going to be okay, and that we're going to save this world. Also, I really shouldn't be saying us, and I've been saying that for the entire video. It's me. He's not mentioning you. You are not involved in any fucking way. I'm just saying us because I need to pretend that you're in this with me and not just watch me summarize a game and living a fulfilling life or whatever. Anyways, here's Rue, that fox we've seen across multiple playthroughs. She asks us if we've seen the other two, meaning Proto and Cedric, and that it means that this plan is coming to fruition. Before we can interject about the other two being missing, though, we start going towards the tower and... Yeah. By this point, everything is starting to get immensely not good. However, path is clear towards the elevator, and we get to this portal room. And we finally tell Rue that the other two are gone. And that pretty much means our one and only last chance, our shot in the dark, is impossible. But before that, Rue asks us to go upstairs and we have a chat on her favorite place in the world. She talks about the AI and robots and the one fundamental law that it must uphold at all times. That it can never harm a living being. However, for this world to be saved, it had to completely violate that one law by transporting Nico to it. And this put itself into a self-destructive spiral where it was destroying itself fundamentally because it just can't resolve conflicts on its own. And I hate to bring up a completely unrelated game this late into the video, but it almost reminds me of Soma. Although that one is immensely darker, and this one has Nico. So obviously we know which one is better. Anyways, at this point, the world machine is self-terminating itself, just due to how much stress it's under trying to resolve everything in a happy ending. And that's why all these glitches are happening, and why the world at this point is on the brink of annihilation, and... The next thing we talk about is taming. So to tame a robot, you have to pretend that that robot is its own being. Its own person, an individual. And eventually, if you do this enough, you hope that it starts to recognize that and construct code based on that, believing that it's a real individual. And this process is extremely long, and it requires a complete and utter suspension of disbelief on your end to do so. And that's why there are so few in this world that are actually tamed. Like, imagine getting an Amazon Alexa, putting it into a mech suit and talking to it over and over and over and over again until it tries to be its own human being. Also, another thing to note is that despite the world machine's self-destructive tendencies, it tends to relent and slow down specifically when Nico is in this world. Although with the other two gone, it's not really a blessing anymore and it's debatable if we can even get Nico home back at this rate. And afterwards, even this favorite area starts to self-destruct. But guess what, boys? These two are still alive, and we can go forth with a plan. Woohoo. A sensible explanation is given, even if it was extremely abrupt. Then you're given another puzzle, where you do some more one-shot document shenanigans. You have to send all of these portals to the big portal to get all the characters over. And after doing so, you're given another version of what seems to be the tower. Although it is infinitely darker and strange and... Just really bizarre. You get to this room, and it's the world machine. Now at this point, it's really, really starting to destroy itself when you talk to it face to face. And this is by far the longest conversation in the entire game. 
even with my relatively fast reading, it took me six minutes just to get through it all, so... I'm going to really have to refine this paragraph a few times over. So here's the world machine. And when you find him, it's just immensely pessimistic. It knows this entire world is code, and since it had to go against its most vital law, to never harm another living being, when Nika was brought into this world, it started to completely break down. At this point, its entire existence was basically a crime. And that's why it advocated for you to save Nico during the first route, because Nico is the only one that's real here. The World Machine finds it pointless to put Nico in danger to save anyone or even everyone else. But everyone in this world is just code. Nico then suggests if this entire route, or a lot of other events in the session, weren't supposed to happen, how did it happen and how the characters know how to respond? How'd their code know what to do, or how to do it if they really were just as limited as their inputs? So he thinks in a sense everything in this world is real, and also says the same thing for the world machine itself. And one thing it really tries to push for more than anything is a happy ending. One that supposedly the creator put in. One where the world, its inhabitants, and Nico all leave happily. So Nico asks it to try and put him through that ending. And if the world was never designed to put a real person in danger, even if it could, on paper, result in Nico being injured, it just couldn't. The world machine then has a rebuttal that it can't because it's not tame. And that's very much not feasible. It talks much like how all the other tamed robots do, and in a sense, Nico is directly taming him by having this conversation. Eventually, there's enough reasoning given that the world machine tries to do what he says. To let Nico potentially danger himself and get the ending that it and its creator strive to make. Doing so, all the danger in front of Nico disappears right in front of him. And this is where we get informed a bit more about a happy ending. It's trying to restore it piece by piece. And Nico will be able to go home and this will all be like a dream to him. Like thousands of others. For me, it will be a story like thousands of others, and that as long as we remember it, everything will be alright. All the characters that were lost on Nico's journey are also placed in a room up ahead so Nico can talk to them one last time. And the room ahead is the credits room, and we can talk to all the characters that seemingly or supposedly died in the credits sequence and it's just really, really fucking cute. All of them give general updates on what happened after Nico left, their thoughts on the journey, what they want to do next in life, and finally, their goodbyes. It's genuinely fantastic. Remember I always said at the beginning that I am an emotional husk when it comes to video game stories? This game is one of three that has genuinely gotten me close to crying. And I want to say to date, literally no games have made me cry and the fact that I got any emotional response out of playing this is practically the highest praise I can give a game story. So you say your goodbyes, Nico goes home, it's all happy, and genuinely this is where I would do the game summary, but really more so than any other game, it would just be a repeat of everything I said, so let me just go ahead and say that One Shot is a solid contender for being in my top 10 favorite games of all time. Don't get me wrong, I loved every game in this video, and another one of them is probably a solid contender for my top 15, but One Shot is something that... Although I've seen remnants of in other games, I've never seen replicated in the same way. And the way that it tells its story is fantastic. The pacing is great, the story is great, the dialogue is great, every character is, even if they weren't really around for that long. In the literal hour I beat this, I just went ahead and bought a Nico plush. He's in the corner of the room, staring at me, menacingly. I think I said something wrong. Anyways, I really, really love this game. It's beautifully unique in a way I really don't know if we're ever going to see again. And genuinely, despite how much that sucks on paper, I'm okay with that. I just really love this game. That's the summary. So let's go to Grimm's Hollow. I found this while scrolling through RPG Maker games on Steam, and I need to be honest with you, Captain, I fell in love with this character design immediately. So before I even played it, I knew I needed to include it in the video. Do you see all the background sprites going on by? 
I included a few from every game, including Grimm's Hollow, exclusively because I knew I was going to at least enjoy it based on aesthetic alone. Hoodies are 100% my thing. Oversized hoodies even more so, especially as someone who is losing a lot of weight and now has flappy noodle arms. Also, I don't even know what you would call the death slash evil personified as a mundane and cutesy force trope, but that's something I'm also equally really into. These are not things you would probably associate with me, but fuck it, the more you know. Booting up the game, we get an entirely brand new message that we've never seen before, and for an actual first, difficulty modes. Now let me be real with you, Captain, I love feeling stressed in my video games. And not just in a story-related sense in gameplay too. I like to have my mind cultivated at all times, just constantly focused on what I'm doing. So I usually play most games I get on the highest difficulty, and usually also do challenge runs on said difficulty. So, personally, I like this a lot. I have absolutely no opinion on the epic gamer difficulty debates that happen every other minute, and personally I just think it's incredibly stupid. I've been an advocate for this criminal idea of you can play a game in the way you like to without having to justify that position or attack others who don't. And if you make your entire online presence I'm going to debate people about Dark Souls and difficulty, I would highly advise going outside. So, cool stuff Grim's Hollow, I like this a lot. I also entirely forgot to mention that most people don't even play these games for the combat anyways, but I digress. First things first, you wake up at a party and you're now a reaper. And again, remember what I said about the cutesy death aesthetic? I love this. I love this a lot. Also another thing I like is your character Lavender. Not only because Lavender is one of my favorite scents and colors, but also she's very abrupt about being woken up in such a way. She doesn't just immediately go with it, she thinks she's been abducted into a cult and tries to call the police. And I don't know what this says about myself, but if I was woken up in such a way, I'd probably try to go full Black Flame Frida and whack some shit. So thank you for having an actual, rational thought process for me, game, because God knows I wasn't capable of it. The titular Grimm comes on in, he gets pissed off about the balloons, and immediately I already love him. We aren't even 30 seconds into the fucking game and I've probably had to freeze the game multiple times over, but I seriously cannot stress enough how much I love this aesthetic. Anyways, Grimm is... well, probably not what you would expect him to be like. He's a rather rational individual and seems to be a lot more caring and empathetic for the Grimm fucking Reaper. So he talks to us a bit more about the basics. Lavender is dead, this isn't a cult that I would like to be abducted into immediately, and the reason she's a reaper is that her spirit isn't strong enough to move on to the afterlife. Keep this line in your handy dandy notebook for later. Her duty is to reap ghosts, who are the poor opposites. Spirits who didn't go to the afterlife because their spirit is too strong, making them frenzied and unwilling to go to the afterlife. You get informed about your apparel, and you ask about your brother Timmy. Grimm has no clue what a Timmy is, but this ghost supposedly does. And he tells us about a location that he may very well be in. Of course, that's your first objective. Before I get there though, I put on my Reaper clothes and talk to the inhabitants. While most of them are just no-name NPCs, there is one called Baker who is just a swell guy. Although Reapers don't really have a need to eat or do normal human things, Eating food is generally just a swell time and gives them some much needed energy for the job. You can buy this food with spirit energy, and once he sells enough he will pass on himself. We'll put another bookmark in there as well and get back to the first in just a second. We get to the cave that we believe Timmy is in and get a combat tutorial. More importantly for now though, after we complete it we get the ghost's excess spirit energy. Spirit energy is this game's currency and experience for leveling up. And if you remember from earlier, I said that a reaper needs to get enough spirit energy from the ghosts in order to pass on to the afterlife. And the second I saw this screen, I thought to myself, yep, this game is going to have an alternate ending when you get the max spirit energy. And that's exactly the case. I'm obviously not going to go too in depth with it right now, as... Well, they're the endings but I wanted to relay it nonetheless. As for the actual combat, 
It actually took me a while to figure out what my problem was because in the early game I was getting my ass handed to me. And I was kind of enjoying it. I was doing this neat combination of using specific abilities, applying ailments, buffing myself, and so on and so forth, RPG things. And then I got to the mid game, and everything fucking died. And I think the culprit is one stat in particular. Speed. So say for example you have a speed of 15, and your enemy has a speed of 15. That's going to be your typical turn-based RPG battle. They're going to do a move, then you do a move, then rinse and repeat. However, let's say you have 30 speed. You're not only going to move first, but you're also going to be able to use another move before they get a chance to react. Now take this, realize your speed can easily reach the higher double digits, Realize there's a very cheap spell you can use that can make you move twice as fast for the rest of the battle. Then realize you can use that spell during your first turn. Yeah, soon enough I was attacking things three to five times before they can even retaliate. These dudes were trying to engage me in a thoughtful game of checkers while I'm playing fucking StarCraft 3. This might be a little bit on the metagamey side, but when I'm defeating the game's final boss in a little under three moves, all the while taking literally zero damage? Yeah, this stat may be a little overtuned. Besides the complete ludicrousness of speed, sadly the status ailments aren't too impactful, but everything else is kind of balanced. I especially really like the really OP magic moves you can unlock that only affect certain enemy types, and just how much interesting physical moves there are in the game. I'd like to imagine a specialist or defensive build is possible and very viable, However, since you can unlock everything in this game, and are heavily incentivized to with a previously discussed ending, this pretty much only impacts the early to mid game, which might be why I was struggling at the very beginning, but I digress. We find our brother Timmy, and he's a ghost. That's, uh, rather concerning for pretty obvious reasons. So for now our best course of action is to keep him in our pocket and make sure he never comes out for any reason while we figure out everything that's going on. So afterwards we talk to Grimm, who is somehow even more casual and laid back from our first conversation, and we go ahead and ask a fair few questions. Namely, if a ghost or a reaper can ever possibly live again. And the answer is a solid no. However, there is one exception. Occasionally some arrive in this world with a soul which is an entirely different thing than a spirit. When you die, your soul completely disintegrates into nothing, and afterwards all that remains is a spirit. But on occasion, that spirit arrives with a soul completely intact, and those can be sent back to life. It is extremely rare, but when it does happen, Grimm usually takes initiative and sends them back to life with haste. If I had to guess my theories that these people are people who came back to life after being dead, like, you know, stuff like the Lazarus Syndrome, or people being comatose for an extremely long amount of time. We can also ask a few more questions, such as why he was upset at the balloons, or if he's a god, and again, all of his answers are extremely lax. His reason for disliking the balloons was... pretty simply, he wanted to be the guy who let them out. And in response to the god question, he simply cites how bad he is at baking, and how there's a lot of things he's not very good at. I love this guy. Honestly, one of my favorite characters in all these games. Anyways, as you may have guessed while discussing this, Timmy did indeed come to this world carrying a soul. He doesn't have it as he ran off the second he became a ghost for pretty blatant reasons, so now it's our job to go find it. Doing so, we go through another cave with this little guy named Baker. And at this point, I won't really cover combat or specific encounters again, as this is the point in the game in which Lavender started overdosing on 5-gum and started rapidly teleporting behind everybody with her kill move. Anyways, Baker is a cool dude, and he makes a lot of sense. He's not really a fighter, and when he woke up into this world as a reaper, he was pretty concerned with that duty until he became what he is today. Then the two go over their appearance and their duty in this new world. And the one thing in terms of appearance that's by far the most important is that when you become a reaper, your facial features become more and more contorted. That's why Lavender actually has no eyes. It wasn't just a stylistic choice like I thought it was, it's because she too is undergoing that same process. And that's also why most people in this world wear a mask, 
as they don't really have a fun time when they look at themselves and they see only decrepit, rotting faces or just sheer darkness. I don't really have a whole lot else to say other than I really like it and it makes this world all that more believable. Well, as believable as this can be. Also, I haven't talked about the music yet. All the overworld music is nice and cheerful and I like it. However, the battle theme just does not sound like a battle theme. It's probably the most jarring thing about this game, and honestly I was going to be a bit dickish and say, oh, I didn't really like this game's OST. And that was until I listened to it again, and yeah, it's all neat. This theme is just that bizarre, it's ridiculously out of place. And is it a strictly bad theme? No, I, I like it, but... This is the type of shit I would expect to hear when I go to the coffee shop and buy, like, you know, a biscuit or cake pop. I'm not really the biggest coffee person, but goddamn do I love cake pops. I will say as a compliment, though, that the background sprites in this game are actually incredibly good. I haven't talked about the pixel art much, but it's great. I, I like it. Some sprites look really off, and I think some probably need a bit more features or refinement, but all around, it's good. I like it. Anyways, for one of the biggest surprises in this entire video, we find the soul and Baker fucking betrays us. Huh? This dude? Really? Baker. Him. What? So, yeah, we're gonna go kick his ass. Getting to him means going through another cave, as well as a genuinely depressing scene with Timmy and Lavender talking about their childhood. And it's a scene with a heavy emphasis on their parents and their relationship. They fought a lot because of money, and generally it's a hard thing for a child to sit through because... You're a kid. And there's always a tendency to think it's right to take a side, especially if a parent confides to you about certain topics or talks to you about situations. And especially so if that parent makes you believe that they're right, or if they really try to push you into thinking the other one is wrong. But eventually the constant arguments raised the dad's already immensely high stress to a point that he died. And although the reasoning is anonymous, there's a lot of potential ways this could be interpreted. And after that, their relations inside the family were always a bit more... solemn. Their mom was more withdrawn and was frequently out of the house, and because of that, Lavender had a lot of thoughts on the situation and had to step up on a lot of things that would normally be accounted for, like groceries and household chores and stuff like that. By the end, she kind of finishes up and admits that Timmy was too young to understand what was really going on, and the reason she said everything she did was she just needed an outlet to vent about her feelings that she never really had while she was still alive. It's very sweet, and I'd say it hits close to home, but I would struggle to qualify blowing up my hometown with a thermonuclear bomb just hitting home. Anyways, we confront him, and this is where the ending split can happen. Baker has been here for a lot longer than us, and as such, is the hardest fight in the game. Is what I would really love to say if Lavender the fucking Hedgehog wasn't here and hitting him at terminal velocity with a scythe every 15 milliseconds. But this is where there are two factors on your ending. Whether or not you defeat him, and whether or not you've hit max level. I will say if the latter sounds very tedious, at least in normal mode, I found a great farming spot near the end with some pretty easy enemies where, at the very utmost, I would say you could probably hit max level in 5-6 minutes. So this isn't some clicker hero's grind to reach E to the power of 1900 experience, it's pretty basic. I also have no clue how easy this is on casual mode, oddly getting these endings may or may not be harder. Although I'd like to say that the greater more than likely accounted for this, and overall increased the amount of EXP you get. Anyways, like I said, once you hit this point you have the choice between four endings. My first of which was beating the final boss and not being max level. Which is honestly probably the most default ending you could expect. Timmy gets to go home as a human, and despite the extreme level of uncanny valley his sprite has, it's extremely cute. Again, Grim is the most lovable dude in the entire world, Baker is a bitch, but a bitch who had a use as nobody else is really going to know how to bake. And overall, it's very bittersweet. 
And after I got this ending, I looked up some more info to see if there was multiple endings, namely with the spirit energy, and sure enough, there is. And I'm glad because it was just a little too default and safe. We don't need any fucking space monkeys, but after all the good this game did, this felt a little bit safe. Like a Disney movie ending, almost. And what surprised me the most was the Baker element, as, again, I completely fucking steamrolled him. If he wins, he takes the soul, which means you can't get Timmy home, and this is doubly worse if you aren't at maximum energy, and oh my fucking god, this is uncharacteristically dark for this game. It is exceptionally out of left field. It sucks, it's so awful. In both endings, you have to attempt to fight Grimm, and... You can't. There's not even a, oh, if you min-max your character in inventory, you can beat him scenario, you just fucking die. If you're not at max level, not only does Timmy die, but you desperately try to escape into the afterlife, fail, and now you're forced to remain here, mindlessly reaping any spirit you find and knowing your entire existence is because of your inadequacy and your mistakes. One of those mistakes is thinking that you can trust somebody. And even if you are at max level, that ending isn't too much better. You immediately die to Grimm, Timmy dies, and you do get to go to the afterlife together, where Timmy meets you and you get this lovely shot. These are some of the most depressing endings in any game I've covered thus far, and this is coming from what I would easily consider the most, quote, happy and laid-back game of them all. I love it, but goddamn they were both stupidly unexpected. But anyways, the best ending is if you beat Baker and are max level. You two pass through the gates of death together, and although they do have to leave each other, they remain together until the very end. Lavender goes to the true afterlife, and Timmy has a very bittersweet epilogue again in the real world. Talking about how much he misses his sister, all the admittedly mundane things they did together that was a little bit better because they were together, and figuring out more and more and more of what she meant in that earlier conversation. Then he talks about how they died, supporting my earlier claim as they were exposed to the elements and he was left in a coma. And the reason that Lavender died while Timmy maintained his soul was that Lavender was holding on to him and trying to keep him as warm as possible during their last moments. He then talks about how much of an impact that this had on their family. How the next few years were exceptionally brutal. How their mom wasn't doing all too great and how much Timmy was struggling without his sister. It's... a lot. And this isn't even really all of it. It's very depressing as much as people call this the best ending. I would more so call this the true ending. Like, don't get me wrong, Lavender gets to go home, but... This is where everything comes together, and really I struggle to think of any more perfect endings for this game. In retrospect, this story really was as great as it could be. It maintains a consistent quality and charm, and I think out of all of them, overall this is the game I would probably recommend to the most people. It covers very deep topics, but not necessarily in a traumatic or extremely dark way that would scare people off. And it's nowhere near as long as the other games being by far the shortest game on this list, and it's free on Steam. No setup required. So if you remember that prompt at the very beginning of the video, where for a long time I was kind of concerned on getting into all these games, I would say for like your average gamer, this is probably one of the best ones to start with. Like don't get me wrong, is it my favorite? No, but really the only things I can say negatively are things that I've said negatively about most games in this video. The combat is generally eh, the difficulty curve is obscure at best, and it's a bit on the short end. But again, just like everything else, I think that's okay. And in the weirdest sense, if you play through this game and these faults are genuinely a little bit much for you, unless you're extremely interested in a story or setting I've mentioned thus far, or doing your own research, I'd imagine it would be fairly hard for one of these games to really capture you. I thought it was really charming and it had a lot of elements in it that I personally really, really enjoyed. The art style, the pixel art, the music, the setting, and the overall story were all hits in my opinion. I'm generally somebody who strays away from numerical scores, mostly because people will see anything below an 8 and go, yep, this game is trash. 
mostly because a lot of companies will give them to games as a participation reward. Like, good job, you had a big budget, here's a 8.5 out of 10, we hated your game. But one of the easiest ways to get across what I want to say is... This is like an incredibly solid 7.5 or 7.8 out of 10 experience the entire way through. And as a free RPG you can install on Steam that isn't, like, gotcha, or microtransactions, or just ludicrous amounts of booba, it's pretty hard to beat what you're getting. It's good. It's really good. I'm starting to repeat myself, so yeah, uh, I like it. Yeah. Alrighty, so To The Moon. I'm going to be as transparent as possible when I say this. To The Moon is so, so far away from a Davy game that I'm actually covering it in this video for that exact reason. And I don't mean this as an insult or a negative. Trust me, I'm going to have an immense amount of positive things to say about it in just a minute. But if it makes sense, this is the type of game that I could tell I was going to come out of the other side really enjoying, and I'd probably look back on it fondly. And I did. But if I didn't make this video, I probably would have never played it, which is kind of a shame. And I mean, I'm glad I did it, if I'm being blunt, this entire video has been me pushing myself outside of my comfort zone and into an entirely new format. And in a sense, this is one of the most perfect games for that. So let's go ahead and play some To The Moon. Mm, you know, to the moon though. To the moon. To the moon! To the moon though! Yeah, we're going! To The Moon starts as all good games should. We get into a car crash because we tried to not hit a squirrel, and... Well, we hit the squirrel anyways, so... Cool. Now I will say I don't know if this makes sense, but in terms of art style, this game is the most standard out of all of them. Yet, by far, it's the most jarring. When I'm exploring other worlds and universes and timelines and realms of reality, going back to a normal Earth is a bit jarring. But it's actually really, really great pixel art. It has a nice amount of detail, it's very nice to look at, it's very visually appealing, and the ambience is just crisp. So, here's two doctors. There's Dr. Neil Watts and Dr. Eva Rosaline. I'll get into them a bit later because I'm going to summarize a lot of this game right off the bat so we can make the rest of it very easy to digest. There's a company called the Sigmund Corporation that uses a technology that creates memories. Now despite the fact that I'm going to assume that the only way this company could ever utilize this tech to an extent is if it's getting funding or technology from the US military. Because as an American, the first thing I thought upon seeing this was, God damn, you can create so, so much trauma with this thing. But in this game, it's actually used for the exact opposite reasons. Since these memories are... Well, memories, that's going to obviously conflict with the patient who is going through them. So they only use this procedure on comatose patients on their deathbed. This procedure sounds complex, but it's very easy to understand once we get more into the game. The best way I could describe it off the top of my head is... Imagine sleeping, but having people guide your dream into a nearly lucid state where you get to experience a very realistic first-person experience. And this is a really great concept, and one that sounds more than capable of spawning some more really great sequels. And sure enough, there are a few sequels to this game. And although I'm not going to play those for this video, I'm going to go ahead and say outright, I could very easily imagine that both of them are similarly fantastic for similar reasons to this game. And another reason for that is... In this game, this wondrous experience that we're escorting people through... Well, it's just a job. This is made extremely clear because there's multiple instances of dialogue in-game that kind of just boils down to harmless employee banter. No matter how wholesome or annoying or tedious, this is still a job. They're employees, they have a thing that they need to do and they need to do it. And it's an extremely strange contrast because you're literally making somebody's dreams come true, but it's entirely understandable. Now let's go ahead and talk about our characters. 
there's not really going to be a huge plot breakdown of their character motivations, what they do in their life, and what their end goal is, because really this is very much a story where I feel like these two characters, although they are characters and have personalities, are borderline self-inserts for the player. At least in this game. Neil is your stereotypical, sarcastic, and dry, nerdy man who pops a few too many pop culture references and, although fairly clumsy and bordering on childish, can be serious if the time comes for it. Eva is the more practical and mature out of the two, the most rational thinker and synonyms for the last few things I said. They contrast fairly well as these characters tend to, and I will say, this is probably a really fucking stupid thing to do, but I did check up on these two character wikis to see if I did potentially miss something. And it does seem with the next game they get a few more characteristics, quirks, qualities, and faults, and I really do love that, because, at least for this game in particular, there were times I was just kind of forgetting I was playing a character. But let's go ahead and get to our patient. This right here is Johnny. Johnny has a dream to... Well, take a wild fucking guess, it's gonna be really hard to screw it up. First, though, we have to explore and find out a few things, and holy shit, there's bunnies. There are so, so many bunnies. They're all over the place. Why is there so many bunnies? Well, we'll find out soon enough, I suppose. So let's begin this process. The way this device works is you link yourselves into the patient's memory and find common links throughout their lives. So basically, for example, let's imagine you have a plushie. So I'll bust this one out, for example. I have... Way, way too many plushies. You can link this memento between two time frames, but first you need to collect memories and do a little puzzle. So maybe you'd be able to go back to the day where I first got this, or ordered it, or whatever. But the point is, this is a puzzle game. There's not going to be a combat system. Unless... No, no, there isn't. I attempted to summon Uboa into this world to test that theory, but unless I had extremely terrible RNG, I don't think it's in this game, sadly. But it's gonna be another story game through and through. But the puzzles are extremely linear. You're not gonna have to explore a map, or get a whole bunch of parts, or do this, or do that. You're generally just gonna be put into a set piece, explore it a little bit, Get what you need to go to the next set piece, explore that one, go to the next one, etc, so on and so forth. And with that, I think I've covered pretty much everything in this game to go back to the usual video style I've been doing, where I go through the game and provide my two cents and experiences as they're happening. So let's go ahead and get inside this dude's brain. Here's John relatively close to the point in which we come over. So this game has a pretty easy to gauge progression system of old to young. And this is where we inquire about some details that would prove to be heavily beneficial. What dreams did you want to accomplish? Why did you want to accomplish that dream? When was your earliest memory of this dream? Do you have any motivation? Stuff like that. Well, this is already pretty rough as this dude has absolutely no clue. Like, yeah, he knows why we're here and what his dream is, but in terms of actual details, he really isn't all that much of a help. Also, that whole this is kind of just a job thematic is pushed even further ahead when we talk about a memory. Somebody who you would suspect to be fully conscious as they're interacting with you in real time, but it's just a program. Theoretically, we could just fucking shove this guy down a cliff or be the biggest assholes imaginable, but since this is the last memory and a string we're going to alter, it doesn't really matter. Now, would that be the case if we did that when he was like, seven years old? Yeah, but this is a completely dumb hypothetical that I'm actually not even sure applies. Point is, we ask him, hey, why did you want to go to the moon, TM? And he just doesn't know. So we gotta go back and find out why he wants to go to the moon, TM, and alter his memories to get him to the moon, TM. Also, here's pretty much the only puzzle in this entire game. Every time you go to a new memory, you have to do this tile minigame, which is definitely a minigame. It's good for what it is, and I'm at least glad there was some sort of interaction in these areas outside of just talking to people, but... It's the type of thing you would find on a random free-to-play mobile game with like 17,000 levels. And there's like an energy system where you only have up to 5 attempts, but it recharges 1 attempt per hour. 
or you can spend money to get more tempts or buy more tempts. And you get like a little advertisement in between every level. This is extremely specific, but you know exactly what I mean. Also in terms of interaction, progressing is kind of just interacting with objects and running around until you fill up a bar. It's kind of repetitive and I feel like it ran into a numerical problem really quickly, with there being five links in every memory, no matter how vital or entirely meaningless. It even jokes about it way later on in the story, and this isn't like a really big complaint, but it's just kind of strange going from a wedding where dozens of family members are over and you're talking to everybody and so many conversations are going on at once, and that's the same amount of memories as going, Hey River, Animorphs. Oh yeah, I haven't mentioned who the fuck River is. So after a few hops you find John crying over a grave of his wife. His wife was named River, and John is just in a lot of grief over what she did. Saying he doesn't understand why she did it, he doesn't expect anybody else would, and... Look, okay, so a lot of this game's story is paced really well, but due to it being chronologically backwards, a lot of this game's story is really hard to write in a script or a summary format. So I'm going to have to completely ruin this game's flow because you're going back in time so more and more stuff is being brought up the further you are. But they're brought up and left ambiguous early on so you can connect the dots as you're going through it. And it's done well. I'm even going to praise it immensely later on, but I'm just saying that without going full let's experience this together in real time let's play mode, there's just going to be a lot of skipping. Anyways, what River did was let herself die. So the house this story takes place in was built by Johnny because they always wanted to build a house near this lighthouse. And River was so excited by this and it's overall very, very sweet. However, midway through construction, River becomes very ill. And since they were midway through building a house, it was going to be financially impossible to treat her illness and finish the house. So River, full well knowing this, despite John's lies, let herself die. She denied all treatment and medication and... Yeah, sure enough she's gone. John then buried her near the lighthouse and was then left entirely alone until he hired a caretaker. And then enough time passes since then that you show up and do your thing. Also the rabbits. So let's talk about River a tad bit more because this is something that is implied over and over and over again throughout the entire game that although never explicitly confirmed, I knew from the word go. River is on the autistic spectrum. Specifically, most people think it's Asperger's. Although it's not THE reason why there's so many bunnies, I was already deeply suspicious that she had autism the second she started showing up in the timeline. But I kind of knew it for a fact the second River's mom called John a neurotypical. Now I don't think I've actually ever said this, but I do have Asperger's, so I knew a lot of the signs immediately. Now the thing is, is that autism is a spectrum, and at least in terms of symptoms, I think at least comparably, mine were pretty mild, and nowadays I don't think I struggle with any symptoms. But I struggled with them a lot growing up. Specifically struggling with a routine, being really good at memorizing and understanding very specific subjects, sensitivity to crowds, places and noises, and generally not really having an easy time understanding people's body language. Nowadays, I think the only symptoms that carried over and are still prevalent in my life is generally a few speech quirks, I guess you would call them, and I still have a very easy time understanding stupidly specific subjects. I am basically a war crime master. But in terms of socialization, I'd actually call myself a pretty big extrovert now. Now, did I need to go in depth with myself talking about River? No, but I wanted to say it because I knew this plot point immediately and Although I don't know if most people would, when a lot of the middle part of the game has dialogue that just boils down to, oh yeah, River has Asperger's, but we're never going to say it outright. But please note, River has Asperger's. Hey player, River has Asperger's. It was just kind of lost on me. Especially when that was frequently interrupted with scenes that was, wow player, check this out. River is doing something that is very frequently seen in people with Asperger's. Anyways, have we nodded at the fact that she might have it? 
And the entire time I was thinking there might be some really specific diagnosis that she has, I'm just completely overseeing and I'm trying to draw a parallel with my life experiences, but no. If I say Asperger's one more time, I swear to god I'm going to watch that goddamn South Park episode again, so I'm going to stop. But a lot of the game during the middle segment is just kind of those last two previously discussed plot points until we get to John's teenage years. And once we find out why he started dating River in the first place. And goddammit, it's cute. And really, I have to compliment this game's storytelling and general pacing. Despite my issues trying to summarize it, I really couldn't see a story like this working any other way than chronologically backwards. In terms of what's actually going on, I've seen this type of story dozens of times. The I am going to love the person or thing with weird qualities because I love their weird qualities. But the way it's told here is entirely unique and it's something that needs an entirely unique premise in order to do correctly. And this game has such a premise with a Sigmund Corporation. Anyways, let's go ahead and skip all the way to why John can't remember why he wants to go to the moon. Trauma. So we find out that John, while growing up, had a brother named Joey, who dies in an accident. After witnessing this, he was given beta blockers to induce memory loss so he could hopefully forget what happened. Although I can't comment on how realistic this is, the main thing is after this point, everything before it is blank, including the reason he wants to go to the moon. That reason ended up being that River and John first met in a carnival. John ran off away from his family after getting a killer score on Whack-A-Mole and met River in her spot. They then talk about the moon and the stars, with River saying that she likes to think that all the stars were very distant lighthouses, and that she always liked to draw bunnies out of the stars in the sky and make the moon its fluffy little tummy. So that's why there's a lot of fascination with rabbits, with lighthouses, with wanting to go to the moon, and so on and so forth. So now our objective with this newfound memory is to find a way to get John to the moon with this information. And Eva decides the best way to do this is to temporarily cut off River and John to make sure that they never meet. And this obviously creates a very big contrast between their contractual obligation to fulfill their patient's desire, and what steps they need to do in order to achieve it, and making sure that the way they do achieve it is something the patient would have wanted. Neil is the more sensible one here going, what the fuck, why, that's obviously not what he would have wanted, no. And this is portrayed very well with his nerdy, clumsy, carefree nature very quickly turning to a more organized yet frantic nature and... Why? Why must you do this? You literally set up the most interesting point of this story. You set up all the building blocks perfectly to have a dramatic finale and this is what you do with it. Why does this keep happening? I really don't know if this is a me thing and I'm taking it a bit too seriously, but I feel like this scene would have been so much better and memorable if everything was just not this. Like, have the walls closing around you, have illusions and other graphical nonsense, like invisible walls or hallways that lead to nowhere. Have your character walk, and after enough walking, teleport back to a random location. You can make a memorable scene where you have character interaction and the two arguing, without it being so ridiculous. Even if the intention was to make it slightly over the top and wacky in order to make the stress and overall anxiety not as... just fucking awful... There's ways of doing it that aren't just whatever the hell this is. And to be blunt, this is probably the most disappointed I've felt in any of these games, and it felt like the ball was not only dropped, but the ball basically became a meteor with how much velocity it has going towards the Earth's crust. But it's all happy now. Eva does a thing, Neil was pissed off but it worked out somehow because the two never meeting led to them both going to NASA and going to the moon together while John's brother Joey survives and actually becomes a famous author like he always wanted to be. I mean all things considered it's a good ending and I'm even willing to excuse the completely ass backwards logic of it all because 
I literally do not even know what type of 78D chess you have to be playing in order for this to be an outcome, but the fact it happens after this severely dampens the impact. But it doesn't really matter. We go outside, we watch a NASA rocket guided on going to Tatooine blast into the sky, we see River and John fly up, they hold hands to the moon. So this is probably going to be the easiest game to summarize because it's pretty straightforward. I'm going to sound like a broken record with how many times I've said this, but would I recommend this game if you've seen this part of the video? Probably not, but it's a great story. One that many people would still stand by as one of the best in gaming, and although I have my faults with it, I have to concede, it's a great story. But that being said, this game does propose a setup that is very, very interesting. This developer has made sequels in an entirely different game, I believe, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say, if any of this enthralled you, you will probably love these games, and I would recommend them wholeheartedly. Well that's kind of all I have to comment on. The gameplay is intentionally bare bones, the graphics were really, really good and detailed and just very aesthetically pleasing, the music was good, the story was great, uh, that's it. That's To The Moon. It was a great story, I really liked it, would recommend the sequels, woot. So let's go ahead and wrap up this video. I have no clue if this is something I'm going to do with the future games I play, but to give my thoughts, I thoroughly enjoyed every game I played. And although there are some I would definitely recommend over others, these are all unique experiences that I easily saw the appeal of, and during this video I frequently visited forums and videos and channels and wikis just to see the communities. And goddamn, it's really cool to see. And specifically in regards to storytelling, it was great to see games cover topics and themes that are generally considered taboo, and that most companies would probably consider too on the nose, or risky, or generally just never approve of. And that's the cool thing about these games. They're all developed by very passionate people who are given a toolbox, and although it wasn't the most in-depth or luxurious toolbox, and they definitely didn't have a whole group of people all using different tools at the same time, they made something wholly unique with it, and in a lot of cases the limitations they had in their set were often overshadowed or integrated into something much greater. I find when it comes to smaller projects that limitations and restrictions can equally help you as much as it can weaken what you're making. And that's something that every developer of every game I've talked about did well. They thought of something they wanted to make, and then found something that lets them make that thing, and although I am definitely sure there were countless features or elements or changes that weren't integrated or scrapped, they all found ways to make something genuinely great with what they were given. They're some of the best indie games I've ever played because they're unapologetically indie. They know what they want to be and what they want to make, and they just go and make it. Were there weak elements in all of them? Undoubtedly. Some of them are even very glaring issues that subtract from the overall experience. But those weak points were often so blatantly overshadowed by the game's strengths that I feel like, no matter what, you're going to come out of these games feeling something. I mean, this is coming from a monotone YouTube guy who makes videos on war crimes, but off the top of my head... There were very few sets of games or genres that could possibly be a better way for me to do a video like this with the intentions I had of stepping out of my comfort zone and finding out more about myself as a creator. Now of course I have to do an outro, but it feels a bit disingenuous to do the standard here's buttons and stuff lol that most channels do, so I just wanted to say thank you for sticking through this video. I know there are definitely things I did wrong and things I could do better, but... If you're here, even if you disliked the video and left unfulfilled, I just wanted to sincerely thank you for giving me a chance whatsoever. And also I want to do a huge shout out to all the devs in this video. I want to leave a fuck ton of links in the description where I bought the games, various developer social medias, and so on and so forth. I would highly advise you check them out if you have any passing interest. And also a big thank you to my patrons who have supported me over the literal month and a half I've been grinding away at this videos, and a few others that will come out soon. I honestly have zero clue if YouTube will like this at all, but if this video didn't strike your fancy, I got a few highly anticipated ones coming soon. 
But if it did, or you're new here and you're like, wow, cool video, I'm more than happy to make more of these in the future, assuming YouTube doesn't nuke it from orbit. And as always, stay frosty, my friends.